I was sitting in the dull, gray break room munching on stale donuts left over from this morning, thinking it would be just another ordinary day. My name is Knox Harrison, and I'm a Navy SEAL based in a remote facility in Alaska. As I took a sip of lukewarm coffee, my superior, Commander Sullivan, barged into the room with an urgent expression on her face. Knox, we've received reports of suspicious activity at an old abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of Anchorage, she said. Pack your gear. We depart in ten minutes. Our team set out for Anchorage in our military SUVs. Along the way, there was a steady stream of easygoing banter among my comrades, sharing stories about that one incident involving a power drill and pineapple or the time someone mistook food coloring for hot sauce. The mood was light, but that would change soon. Upon arrival at the deserted warehouse, things seemed calm and uneventful. Our team conducted a perimeter sweep while Commander Sullivan ordered me inside to locate any evidence that could explain the peculiar events reported. The immense structure loomed above me like a rusted sepulcher as I pushed open its creaky door. I could only rely on my flashlight to pierce through the black void that swallowed every trace of light within its confines. My boots crunched on broken glass as I maneuvered around abandoned machinery left to rot like rusty fossils. I suddenly heard faint scraping noises coming from a corner. Cautiously, I approached an old metal cabinet shaking as if something was trapped inside. Stealing myself for whatever awaited behind the door, I yanked it open and discovered a mutilated corpse. A wave of gut-churning horror washed over me at the sight. Bones snapped like twigs and skin flayed into ribbons accompanied by a seemingly purposeful patchwork of deep gashes. It wasn't just the level of atrocity that unnerved me. It was the unsettling feeling that this grotesque act didn't fit any profile I knew from my years of experience. I radioed my team for backup. With their arrival, we found more corpses, each one brutally mangled in different demonic ways. The warehouse started to resemble a house of horrors. As we cautiously combed through the dimly lit halls, Jared, our demolitions expert, called out. Hey, you guys ever hear the one about the demon and the accountant? We listened attentively as comic relief was much needed in that godforsaken place. Despite his attempt to lighten the mood, it did little to shake off an intense feeling of dread that hung over us like a shroud. After thoroughly examining every inch of the warehouse's interior, our group ventured outside, where we stumbled upon a series of gruesome tracks leading into the surrounding woods. They belonged to no beast I had ever encountered, and neither had those with hunting backgrounds or previous experience in these parts. Fearful but resolute to uncover the truth behind these atrocities and protect anyone from further harm, we pressed onwards. We tracked what looked like clawed footprints deeper into the forest while nightfall crept over the Alaskan horizon, swallowing any remnants of sun and leaving us enveloped in darkness. The air hung heavy with tension as we moved through dense foliage and looming trees that cast eerie shadows across our path. Suddenly, a piercing scream split the ominous silence. One of our men stumbled into view clutching his arm tightly blood oozing between his fingers. Dylan! What happened? I cried out. He collapsed against the tree trunk, gritting his teeth from sheer anguish as he attempted to gather himself. I didn't see it. I just felt something tear at my arm from nowhere, he whispered hoarsely. In that moment, a monstrous figure emerged from the shadows the sight of it evoking a heaviness in my chest that hampered my very breath. Its terrifying presence was overwhelming. Its grotesque features burned into my memory like a deranged work of art. It stood over eight feet tall, with razor-sharp claws adorning elongated, sinewy limbs and a head resembling that of an abhorrent fusion between man and beast. 
intense yellow eyes glared at us as it let out an otherworldly growl. The creature lunged at us, its claws tearing through the air with a viciousness I had never seen before. My heart raced as instinct took over, prompting our group to scatter in all directions. Each of us dove for cover, desperate to escape the relentless beast that pursued us. In my panic, I found refuge behind a large boulder and quickly scanned my surroundings for any sign of my comrades. I spotted Lucy hiding under a fallen tree, her eyes wide in terror as she clutched her flashlight, trying to signal me. We need to call for help, she whispered hoarsely. We're out of our depth here. I nodded in agreement painfully aware that none of us had brought satellite phones on this expedition because our original mission was meant to be a simple examination of an abandoned warehouse. As we tried to find any means of communication or a way to evade the monstrous creature, its blood-curdling growls and ear-splitting shrieks served as constant reminders that we were being hunted. We knew we'd be no match for it in direct combat, so evading capture and calling for help remain top priorities. Slowly and cautiously, we attempted to reconnect with the rest of our group while avoiding detection from the horrifying ogre-like fiend. One by one, we found them, all except for Dylan, whose screams we'd heard earlier when he sustained injuries at the hands of the now-dismembered animalistic beast. After regrouping and devising a hasty plan, we made our way back toward the warehouse in hopes of finding shelter or at least some means of contacting help. The oppressive atmosphere weighed heavily on each of us as we navigated through the dark forest, the urgency of escape looming over us. Once reunited at the seemingly safe warehouse, we discovered a radio tucked away on one of the dusty shelves. With bated breaths and trembling fingers, we attempted to contact local authorities. Static filled the air before a voice finally responded. This is the Alaska State Troopers. State your emergency. Please, you have to help us. I shouted into the radio, doing my best to convey the urgency of the situation. We're being hunted by some sort of creature in the woods and one of our group members is already injured. We're tracking your location now. Stay put and try to remain hidden. Advised the voice coming from the radio, sounding equally terrified and skeptical. Feeling a renewed sense of hope, we barricaded ourselves inside the warehouse while we waited for help to arrive. The minutes ticked by like hours as we hid in terror, praying that the creature wouldn't find us before rescuers arrived. With a disdainful shriek, I could hear it coming closer, its heavy footsteps reverberating through the warehouse as the walls rattled around us. At that moment, flashing lights cut through the darkness outside, followed by voices shouting commands and clamoring footsteps as help finally reached us. They stormed towards the creature which tried to retreat from their arrival but flew into a fit of rage instead when it couldn't escape. Alaska State Troopers and local hunters opened fire on the beast, their bullets striking it relentlessly in a deadly hailstorm. It thrashed about violently before finally collapsing to the ground defeated at last. We watched in awe as powerful hunt dogs sunk their teeth into whatever flesh they could reach. After ensuring our safety and receiving medical attention for Dylan's injuries, we were escorted back to civilization with wounds and traumatized memories that would last a lifetime. I can't help but think of those who may not have been as lucky, who may have crossed paths with that grotesque monstrosity before us and failed to survive. In moments like these, I'm reminded how fragile life truly is. And no matter what happens, the visceral fear from our encounter with that nightmarish creature will never leave us. I was sipping my morning coffee, pondering over the last thing my buddy Jeff said. Why do bald men never use keys? I chuckled. 
It was just another ordinary day at work. Or so I thought. My name's Dane Ferguson, a 38-year-old Navy SEAL assigned to a secret mission in the dense forest surrounding Crescent City in California. The mission seemed routine to investigate suspicious activity reported by some hikers. But as our small team trekked through the woods, we began to notice signs of a struggle. Broken branches littered the ground and dragged marks led deeper into the forest. We cautiously proceeded forward, following this disturbing trail. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a grisly scene, a mutilated body, torn apart and barely recognizable. Whatever or whoever did this had to be close. Our team quickly fanned out in search of any signs pointing to who could have committed such acts. Muffled cries led us to another victim, his legs badly mangled and bloodied. Stay with me, Tom pleaded with the injured man, applying pressure to his wounds as he called for backup. Despite our training, none of us had ever encountered anything like this before. As I surveyed our surroundings, ready to confront the menace that lurked nearby, an unusual scent filled my nostrils something pungent but not altogether unpleasant. This way, I whispered, leading our shaken group towards the source of this intoxicating aroma. Suddenly, we heard guttural growls echoing through the trees. We readied our weapons as an unnaturally large creature slowly emerged from behind a thicket. As it stepped into the clearing, we finally got a full view of it. It stood about eight feet tall on muscular legs resembling those of a kangaroo but tipped with vicious claws. Covered in ragged gray fur tinged with blood stains, its elongated canine-like face featured hooded reptilian eyes and an impressive set of serrated fangs. Razor-sharp talons were visible on every limb, including the ends of long, ape-like arms draped at its sides. In that moment, we all hesitated, struck by the raw power and ferocity of this ungodly beast. Each of us silently questioned if our extensive training could even stand a chance against this brute force. We need to call for backup, whispered Lucy nervously as she gripped her rifle tighter. I agree, I replied, my voice unsteady with fear. This thing is too strong for us to handle alone. I was about to signal for reinforcements when the creature abruptly lunged at one of our comrades. We instantly sprang into action as bullets flew through the air in a desperate attempt to bring it down. But despite being hit multiple times, the monster barely flinched. It clawed through my teammate Steve, the sound of his screams mixing with the crunch of his bones. The creature easily swatted aside any attempts to stop its brutal onslaught. We had trained for all kinds of threats, but this monster seemed unstoppable. Fall back! We need to regroup! I yelled, ushering everyone deeper into the trees away from the creature's reach. The remaining team members reluctantly followed, unwilling to leave our fallen comrade behind but knowing there was no other choice. Sorrow weighed on our hearts as we quickly retreated through the forest. Steve was gone, and we couldn't save him. It felt like an insurmountable failure, leading us blindly into this nightmarish situation. The guttural growls of the beast never seemed to fade, chasing us relentlessly and instilling terror with each twisted snarl. Its every step made the earth quake beneath our feet a horrifying reminder that it was not far behind. Out of breath and exhausted, we finally stopped to catch a fleeting moment of respite. We need help. I managed between heavy breaths. We have to call it in. I grabbed the radio and began frantically trying to make contact with headquarters. Static filled my ears as I desperately repeated our situation and location hoping someone would hear us and send reinforcements. Lucy crouched down beside me, her body trembling with fear as she grasped my hand tightly. I could see it in her eyes she didn't believe we would make it out alive without more help. We'll survive this, 
I said, trying to sound reassuring despite my own heavy doubts. As we waited for a response on the radio or signs the creature might have lost our trail, a cacophony of shouts burst through the static. For a moment, relief washed over me as I realized help might be on its way. Suddenly, a deafening roar echoed from just behind us. The creature had found us again. Panic-stricken, we scrambled to our feet and sprinted through the trees without any sense of direction. The beast pursued us relentlessly. Each heavy lumbering gallop brought it terrifyingly close to our group. I could sense its teeth snapping just inches from my shoulder, fear-inducing adrenaline course through my veins. A sharp pain pierced my side as I pressed on, every stride fueled by sheer desperation. In an act of brave defiance, Tom stopped and spun around with his weapon raised. His shouts ricocheted off the trees as he emptied his gun in a hail of bullets into the depths of its horrid maw. The creature paused for a brief moment before it lunged at him, knocking him down and swiping furiously at his prone figure. Streams of blood seeped from his wounds into the forest floor as he cried out in pain. Before we could even muster an attempt to save him, an authoritative voice boomed through the radio commanding us to move away from Tom and get to safety. My heart sank as I hesitated for a split second before whispering my apologies to Tom and towing the rest of my team deeper into the darkness. Our eyes were drawn back in horrified fascination as we watched the monstrous creature rip Tom apart, extinguishing the last hopeful glimmers that we might fight through this terror. Reinforcements finally arrived shortly after that gruesome display. With their help, we managed to trap and kill the abominable creature we had encountered in the woods. It was a violent struggle, one that cost even more lives. Each day since then, I remember Steve and Tom who were cruelly taken from us by that monstrous thing in the forest. It sometimes still haunts me when I close my eyes, but now it's gone both their brave sacrifices weren't entirely in vain. We mourn our lost friends, but we carry on, knowing that we faced the unimaginable and survived. Life will never be the same, and the pain will always be there but we move forward for them because it's what they would have wanted. I just returned from a lengthy deployment, and my best friend Jake Russo had insisted on celebrating at my favorite local bar in San Diego. There was nothing quite like a cold beer after months away and we clink glasses in celebration. Hey, Derek Torres, that's not your usual drink, my friend observed. Yeah, I chuckled. Decided to try something different this time. As we were catching up, a woman from across the room caught our attention. Her face was stricken with terror, and her hands were shaking uncontrollably. I think someone needs help, Jake whispered cautiously. People were gathering around her now, trying to figure out what was going on. Drawing on our Navy SEAL training, we cautiously approached the frantic woman. Between sobs, she managed to relay that a horrifying creature had attacked her colleagues at their secret facility just outside of town. Now at full alert, we decided to investigate further. We made our way to the facility a hidden base concealed in the hills surrounding San Diego. As we entered the seemingly ordinary building, something felt off. There was an eerie silence engulfing us. We navigated dimly lit hallways and came across a grisly sight. Torn bodies littered across the floor. The wounds were vicious and unlike anything we'd ever seen before. The air was thick with dread. The terror was palpable. It's like a slaughterhouse in here. I muttered under my breath. No kidding, Jake responded. What kind of animal could do this? We tapped our vast investigative experience 
and began searching for any survivors while trying to piece together what had happened at this once bustling facility. Alarmingly, all security footage had been wiped clean. Whatever was responsible for this massacre was thorough. All that remained were gnarled scraps of clothing and equipment that hinted at what might have transpired just hours before. We made a silent agreement to call for backup immediately. Jake reached for his phone and dialed the emergency line, providing the necessary details. Help is on the way, he confirmed with a grave tone. The creature responsible was still at large, and its victims deserved justice. We couldn't let it harm any more people. Suddenly, we heard a deafening roar echo down the hallway. The sound sent waves of fear through our bodies, but we knew running away would only leave others in danger. Breathing heavily, we prepared ourselves for what we might face. As we continued through the facility, with its blood-stained walls and grisly aftermath still fresh, that monstrous roar remained ever-present. It was taunting us. Rounding a corner, we finally came face to face with the elusive attacker. The creature was beyond anything we could have imagined or described. It stood nearly eight feet tall, on muscular legs with razor-sharp claws for feet. Its immense body was covered in coarse fur and thick scales. A monstrosity of teeth protruded from its grotesque mouth slavering saliva as it growled menacingly. But perhaps the most disturbing feature was its eyes, bloodshot orbs that sank into those present with a chilling malevolence. I froze for an instant, panic-stricken by this abomination's very existence. Jake yanked me back into motion, urging me to keep moving despite our irrational urge to stand and watch in horror. We scrambled deeper into the facility as the creature began hurtling towards us. As we fled through uncharted hallways, attempting to create some distance between ourselves and this nightmare-infused predator, I chanced upon a set of heavy iron doors that appeared reinforced compared to their surroundings. Jake! In here! I shouted urgently. We threw open the doors and shut them behind us as quickly as possible, listening as the creature's claws scraped across the surface just moments later. The sound was blood-curdling, but we had no choice. We set to work devising a plan. We assessed our surroundings for potential escape routes, but found none. We were in a makeshift laboratory, filled with hazardous materials and questionable experiments. As we deliberated on the plan, the creature mercilessly tried to rip the doors from their hinges, denting the metal with each violent blow. Time was running out. We heard a second, distinctive set of footsteps coming down the hall as the backup we called for finally arrived. They attempted to engage the creature, but their efforts seemed hopeless. Fire and bullets barely phased it as it tore through the reinforced crew that came to our aid. In this moment of sheer desperation, I noticed a large container of explosive material on a nearby shelf. We didn't have much choice. Igniting it could level the entire room, us along with it, though doing nothing would lead to infinite destruction in the creature's wake. Jake! We have one shot at stopping this thing. I shouted over the chaos, grabbing for detonators in our desperate bid for survival. Together, we wired the explosives and braced ourselves for impact. What happened in those next few seconds felt like hours, struggling to flee while watching flames engulf our nightmarish adversary. Inexplicably, we survived that explosion, left with memories of those lost and deepening uncertainty about what just transpired became both thankful and haunted by that narrow escape from annihilation. The mangled remains of that monstrous abomination were later recovered from the rubble by military personnel, taken away under tight security, never to be seen again. Life goes on, though our world remains forever altered by that encounter. 
I find solace only in knowing that we stopped the terror before it could consume more lives. I took a deep breath as I stepped into the dimly lit warehouse, trying to shake off the tension. My name is Jackson Allerton, a Navy SEAL, and though I've been on countless missions, this one felt different. The warehouse was located in a secluded part of Detroit whose industrial glory had long faded. Our assignment was highly classified, so much so that even our team leader only gave us updates on a need-to-know basis. My fellow operative and friend, Marcus Weston, walked beside me. He too felt uneasy. Why do we have to be here at night when there are precisely zero lights in this place? Marcus muttered as he stumbled over an uneven patch of the floor. The ambience? I quipped, hearing him crack a smile for a moment. We continued making our way through the building while doing our best to stay focused on the task at hand. Out of nowhere, we heard scream blood-curdling and full of terror. We exchanged glances before rushing towards it. Upon reaching the scene, we found Mika Hayes, another agent unconscious on the floor in a pool of her own blood. Her leg was torn open as if by some powerful creature with sharp claws. What happened? I yelled. I... I don't know. Marcus stammered, his usual composure shaken by what he saw before him. She must have tried calling for help but couldn't. We radioed our team leader Selena she for backup and quickly secured Mika in a safe location within the warehouse where she could receive aid. As we inspected the area where Mika was attacked, we noticed large claw marks on the walls and ground. This was completely unexpected. Never did we anticipate encountering something so visually rogues K in comparison to human behavior. This wasn't normal nor known to us prior. Marcus squinted as he studied the claws. Jack, he whispered to me. I know some animals can break into places, but this doesn't feel like a random act of wildlife. I couldn't deny the brutal nature of Mika's injury, as it was akin to that of a predatory animal, but there was something inexplicable about the intelligence behind the attack. Days went by as we continued our mission, and more wounds were discovered, eerily similar to Mika's. Our team adjusted. It was either adapt or crumble with paranoia. Marcus decided for all intents and purposes that improvising dialogue was necessary. Why did the creature cross the road? To haunt the other side. He joked, his attempt at lightening the mood. But after several attempts to track down the source of these assaults in cahoots with finding a resemblance to their origins and plans of action, we were left feeling utterly defeated. Then, on a dark night when moon clearly illuminated our surroundings something stirred from within the shadows. Silent and calculated steps were made around abandoned equipment when suddenly something caught Marcus' attention. He saw movement reflected in his peripheral vision. Approaching cautiously towards where it might have retreated, he stopped dead in his tracks. In front of Marcus stood a hideous beast, towering above him with protruding spines lining its back and seemingly long claws extending from its limbs. Its eyes bore into Marcus's soul as venomous drool dripped from sharp teeth converging into dagger impressions along its snout which extended two meters in length standing upright on hooves that had hitherto never been described in any textbook. The creature snorted a thick breath of condescension, as if gesturing for us to make our best attempt at stopping it. It was in that moment that Marcus decided to call for help. Quickly, he pulled out his radio and shouted, Guys! We've found it! Get over here now! His voice wavered as he struggled to maintain control of his fear. Within moments, our team appeared from various hiding spots, each of them clearly shaken by the sight before us yet keeping focused on the task at hand. 
No one mentioned any folklore or mythology we had been trained to deal in facts and real-world solutions. So we tried to anticipate and react with logic even in the face of this monstrous creature. Seeing that our reinforcements had arrived, the beast snorted and launched itself toward us with great speed and force. We realized that trying to engage it head-on would likely end badly for us after all. We were not equipped or trained to deal with something so vicious and unfamiliar. Keep your distance! I shouted as I tossed a flare towards the creature. The sudden light seemed to momentarily blind and disorient the beast, giving us enough time to focus on escape rather than confrontation. As the team began retreating to a safer location, we quickly strategized about potential options. This creature was dangerous and unpredictable attempting another direct confrontation would surely result in casualties. Instead, we devised a plan that would leverage our technological resources, hoping to outsmart the creature rather than outfight it. Utilizing non-lethal traps we had brought with us on the mission, we set up a series of obstacles and diversions aimed at immobilizing or ensnaring the beast. Expertly calculating its route and trajectory based on previous encounters, our team ensured they would have optimal opportunities to subdue the beast without coming under direct attack themselves. The creature noticed our attempts and stepped warily around some of them but got inevitably caught up in a few others. As it struggled heavily against these restraints, roars echoed through the forest. We knew we had to act fast before it broke free. Although we were all aware of the urgency, approaching the creature now entangled in our web of traps was still dangerous. It was then that our explosives expert, Amanda, took the initiative. She confidently approached the writhing creature, armed with a powerful tranquilizer gun she had prepared earlier in anticipation of such circumstances. Aiming carefully, Amanda fired two darts into the creature's muscular neck. It roared in pain, and we tensed as it struggled even more violently to break free. Soon enough, though, the tranquilizer seemed to take effect. Its body began to weaken and slow down until it fell unconscious. In this subdued state, we hastily retreated from the scene and contacted our superiors for further instructions. While on the retreat, we had only scattered conversation about what just happened. We all knew this encounter would pose more questions than answers, but for now, our priority was getting out alive. As we finally reached safety and regrouped with other units who had been searching for us since our distress call cut off abruptly earlier, word quickly spread about the mysterious beast we had encountered and narrowly escaped. Our tale necessitated an unprecedented level of cooperation between various scientific and government agencies who would work together to analyze and ultimately contain this threat before more people fell victim to its savage attacks. As we recuperated back at our base camp, discussing potential cover stories to concoct about these events anything involving folklore or paranormal was strictly out of bounds dash. I couldn't help but reflect on those whose lives were irrevocably impacted or lost fighting this relentless antagonist Mika and others whose wounds would forever remind them of this terrifying incident. Despite my attempt to focus on reality rather than tall tales or myths, I couldn't shake one haunting thought. What other unknown fears could be lurking in the shadows? And how would we ever be prepared to face them? I remember the taste of the coffee I brewed, bitter and hastily consumed. My name is Leon Wilkerson, a Navy SEAL leading a covert operation in an abandoned warehouse at the outskirts of Detroit. My team and I have been here for hours, preparing to eliminate a dangerous criminal. We utilized the map of the location as our guide while we strategized on our next move. The air was tense as our radios crackled to life with updates from another team hidden nearby. 
Hey Leon, do you know why a scarecrow won an award? Whispered Tim, my second in command, looking to ease some tension. Because he was outstanding in his field. A collective groan went through my team, but it lightened the mood. Time wore on as we continued examining the area. The more we uncovered about this warehouse, the stranger things became. It appeared abandoned for years, but fresh evidence suggested recent activities, fast food wrappers and disturbed dust on the floor. Suddenly, we heard faint screams coming from the other side of a locked door. Our hearts raced while our minds remained rational analyzing that these people could be hostages hidden by this horrendous criminal mastermind. Without missing a beat, Tim expertly unpacked and assembled his breaching kit. With perfect synchrony developed over time spent training together, he broke open the door. As we scouted the dark room, our flashlights passed over a gruesome sight, bodies mangled beyond recognition. Nausea crept over me as we confirmed there were no survivors. Carefully investigating further revealed irregularities, claw marks and deep gashes inconsistent with any weapon we were familiar with. Amidst hushed conversations and furrowed brows, it slowly dawned on us that something entirely different might be responsible for this massacre. Suddenly, there was a low growl reverberating through the room. Our guns at attention toward its source led us into the dark recesses of the warehouse, and eerie silence prevailed. All we had to rely on was our instincts, as doubt clouded our initial intel. Motioning for my team to keep a safe distance, I entered another chamber and saw it for the first time. The creature before us was an abomination, a twisted manifestation of violence and bloodlust. It was colossal in size and its thick, gnarled limbs quivered with anticipation. The hair covering its body was dark and slick with blood. Its mouth bristling with razor-sharp teeth seemed never to close completely, hungry for its next meal. Gavin, one of my teammates, broke into cold sweat as realization struck him. I've heard about this thing. People call it the mauler. Mutilations, killings in other states... It ain't a human. We might have wandered into its territory. What ensued was a nerve-wracking game of cat and mouse between us and the creature. The creature stalked us through the labyrinthine warehouse as we tried to stay one step ahead. It shrieked in frustration each time we evaded its grip, but confidently toyed with us. Exhaustion threatened to get the best of us, but every time we almost slipped... I tried to lighten the atmosphere. I cracked another joke. Hey guys, a vulture boards a plane carrying two dead raccoons. Passenger says they only allow one carrion item. The delirious laughter filled us with much needed determination. Our ammunition fell short against this monstrous beast. Even after numerous direct hits, it insisted on pursuing us relentlessly. That's when we made our boldest decision, torch the place down, eliminate any chance of it escaping or endangering others. Containing this malevolent force became our sacred duty. Slowly, seamlessly maneuvering through the warehouse depths with my team, flames flickered around us and acrid smoke filled our lungs. It was getting harder to put one foot in front of the other but, in unison, we marched on. Frantic radio transmissions scrambled while we communicated our plan to the other squads that were waiting outside. Armed with firebombs and hunting rifles, they would stand ready to contain this prowling abomination as the place crumbled around it. As we continued to navigate our way through the warehouse, we used firebombs and industrial-grade torches to set fire to the structure from inside, hoping to flush out the mauler and keep it from escaping. We moved deeper into the maze, using radios to stay in touch with our teammates while avoiding the creature's increasingly bold and vicious attacks. We were running low on energy, hope rapidly fading as the flames grew more intense. Yet, there was no opportunity to call for help. 
our only focus was ensuring the mauler didn't make it out. If we failed, its reign of terror would continue unabated. Our group was methodically hunted down by the mauler, one of us pinned against a wall, another dragged off into the darkness while the rest of us barely made it out of harm's way each time. With every encounter, we stared at death's metallic maw adorned with teeth capable of rending flesh from bone. It became clear that even if we made it out alive, we were not going to leave unscathed. I could hear my teammates' labored breaths and whispered words of encouragement over the radio, giving strength where possible. Suddenly, a cry went up as the mauler lunged at Gavin from one dark corner. We were unable to save him. His desperate screams cut short in an abrupt, sickening crunch. His gruesome fate left us questioning our odds of survival. It all came down to one final confrontation in the heart of this nightmarish inferno. Flames lashed at us like hungry serpents tearing through materials that had once seemed sturdy and reliable. Cornered like rats in a sinking ship, we witnessed the mauler prowling through smoke and dancing its wicked dance around the flames. As a last-ditch effort, Samantha tossed a firebomb directly at the creature. Momentarily stunned by her bravery and suicidal gambit, it paused in shock, giving us a few precious seconds to gather what remained of our strength. Samantha didn't live to see her moment of defiance, as the mauler retaliated by slashing her to pieces before retreating. The remaining fire eventually consumed the warehouse. As the smoke cleared, we made our way through the skeletal remains of the once mighty structure, knowing that in the end, we had taken a terrible toll on ourselves and lost a part of our souls in the process. Gavin and Samantha would not be forgotten, their sacrifice etched into our hearts for all time. We stared out across the smoldering wreckage, wondering if we had truly defeated the mauler or if it was merely preparing for its next game in some other unsuspecting location. This creature born of primal instinct and bloodlust was capable of anything. Who could tell what would happen if this relentless menace resurfaced? For now, at least, there was silence. But under that stillness lay a new tension. When would the mauler return? Who would be forced to take up arms against it next? Our actions may have been enough for today, but only time holds the answer to those questions. I remember downing my last cup of coffee before I had to rush out for the mission. My name's Nathaniel Trenton, but my buddies call me Nate. As a Navy SEAL, there was never a moment to waste. My team consisted of Tiberius Knox and Yolanda Creed, both extraordinary in their roles. We were assigned to a top-secret mission at an abandoned facility in the heart of Death Valley, California. Little did we know what lay ahead. Our operation aimed to retrieve confidential documents from the building before they fell into enemy hands. We had packed our weapons, toolkit, and high-tech gadgets to aid us. As we approached the destination, the cold desert air filled the night as Tiberius cracked an absurd joke about a chicken crossing the road. Yolanda and I burst into laughter. It helped break the tension in these moments. The facility stood tall like a menacing giant from a bygone era. Windows shattered, walls covered in graffiti, and mysterious dark hallways inviting us in. If these walls could talk, Yolanda whispered while scanning our surroundings with her rifle. We cautiously made our way inside the building, scanning every corner for potential threats. Our footsteps echoed through the hollow halls, amplifying our presence unintentionally. Gradually, as we crept deeper into the building, we stumbled upon scratches on the walls, deep gashes that looked almost like claw marks but too large for any regular animal. Our curiosity peaked. Danger or not, we continued forward. 
Tiberius proceeded down one hallway while Yolanda and I moved into another, deeper inside the facility. Rusted old pipes dripped water onto my head. My face twitched in disgust as it trickled down my jacket. We discovered an office with scattered files on every surface and half-open drawers with their contents haphazardly strewn about like some kind of animal had searched the place. Before I could make any assumptions, Tiberius' voice rang out through the radio. Guys, you need to check this out. Tiberius sounded excited and concerned at the same time. We paced back to meet him, as I rehearsed that chicken joke in my mind, intending to lighten up the mood. However, the sight that preceded our arrival left us speechless. There lay mutilated corpses, hundreds of deep lacerations tearing through their flesh. What a macabre scene. Yolanda gagged as her hand shot towards her mouth while Tiberius examined the grotesque spectacle before us. Scratches on the floor seemed to determine a clear path that led further into the darkness. I pulled them away from the unsettling sight. We need to continue our mission and grab those documents before it's too late. I instructed them firmly. We followed the scratches on the floor as a trail, heading deeper into the unknown. As we walked, I noticed massive footprints alongside the claw marks further confirming that whatever had caused this destruction was no ordinary animal. Our search for the documents led us to a secure room with reinforced doors, barely hanging by their hinges. As we tried to access a computer inside, I heard rustling in the distance. We should call for backup, I whispered to my teammates. But Yolanda shook her head and voiced her concern that calling for help could put more people at risk. We all hesitated, ultimately agreeing that it was best to finish our mission without involving others. Suddenly, the lights went out. Our flashlight beams cut through the darkness like knives as we frantically searched for an exit. Then, without warning, we heard a guttural growl. My instincts kicked in and I knew I had to get my team out of there. We ran blindly through the dark halls, our hearts pounding in our ears. Up ahead, we saw a formidable creature emerge from the shadows. It stood on two enormous legs with elongated arms ending in razor-sharp claws. Its features resembled that of both man and beast, protruding snout filled with enormous teeth and wild eyes that seemed void of any human thought. The creature lunged at Tiberius, who barely managed to evade its sharp claws. Knowing we couldn't fight this monster, we split up to buy time and find an escape route. I scrambled down one hallway while hearing behind me the sounds of chaos. The creature gave chase without missing a beat. Its terrifying roars only fueled my desire to escape. In the distance, I spotted an emergency exit sign above a door. With what felt like only seconds to spare, I burst through the door and slammed it shut behind me just as the creature crashed against it from inside. Gasping in relief, I sprinted through the wooded area surrounding the facility, trying to find my teammates, hoping they'd managed to escape as well. As I found Tiberius and Yolanda both breathing heavily from their ordeal, we came to the unanimous decision that we needed to report our findings and request immediate extraction. We radioed for help, explaining the situation with the creature inside and the shocking state of the facility. Though our voice trembled, we did our best not to let fear overcome us. Help arrived within minutes in the form of a heavily armed team tasked with dealing with the threat. They took our statements and ushered us out of the restricted area. As they approached the building, ready to confront that horrifying creature, I couldn't help but feel remorse for those who had lost their lives so brutally inside that dark place. Days later, Yolanda, Tiberius, and I were debriefed on what went down at the facility. The experts had analyzed DNA samples from the deceased and concluded that an experimental mutation process had taken place, leading to a creature beyond our understanding, 
deadly and uncontrollable. The government decided to classify all information related to this incident as top secret. In the end, though we didn't manage to recover the documents we sought initially, we survived a harrowing experience that tested us physically and mentally. We knew deep down this experience would weigh heavily on our souls for years to come. We often remember those who perished at the hands of such unimaginable terror and wondered what might have happened if it hadn't been for our sheer determination as a team. But one thing was certain. Every mission from then on would be seen through new eyes. Eyes that had witnessed the darkness no human should ever have to face. The battle against monstrous creatures in hidden corners of society may have been won this time. Still, an uneasiness remained knowing that these horrors might still dwell in areas yet undiscovered. I'll never forget the first time I heard about Smithfield Lake. My buddy, James Fitzwilliams, and I were stationed in Richmond, Virginia, looking for some much-needed relaxation after a tedious military exercise. Hey Marcus, have you ever been fishing out in Smithfield Lake? He asked casually, trying to stifle a laugh after cracking one of his usual jokes. Smithfield Lake was notorious among locals for the unexplained and brutal murders that happened around it. People wanted desperately to believe these were simply acts perpetrated by a wild animal. As days turned into weeks, our curiosity grew stronger until we couldn't hold back any longer. We decided to carry out a secret inspection mission. After all, we were skilled Navy SEALs. Whatever this creature was, we could handle it. Packing our weapons and gear, James and I left our base at dusk and headed toward the lake. We weren't authorized to investigate anything outside our missions, but the curiosity was just too strong. Reaching the lake was like stepping back in time. The moon reflected beautifully on its calm surface. Soft ripples danced and swayed beneath the silver moonlight. Trees formed a picturesque canopy around this secluded paradise where chirping crickets harmonized with the quiet rustling of leaves. We should set up camp here. I suggested while scanning the area for any signs of danger or suspicious activity. As we pitched our tent, we couldn't help but notice how peaceful everything seemed. Could it be possible that such gruesome killings occurred in this seemingly idyllic spot? Hours ticked by and night settled in with no progress made. There weren't any sounds out of the ordinary for that locality. We decided to get some rest and continue our investigation in the morning. Awakening at dawn's first light, we stood facing the aftermath of carnage. Animal carcasses strewn grotesquely amidst trails of blood scattered throughout our campsite. Mangled bodies, torn limbs and disfigured faces painted a horrifying picture of what had happened the previous night. Feeling our hearts race as adrenaline pumped through our veins, we knew it was time to call for backup. We tried to contact our unit, but the radio interference left us utterly alone. Taking in the scene, I noticed one particular carcass had an unusual laceration, unlike anything we'd ever seen. Lying beside it were large, distinct footprints not belonging to any known animal. As sunset approached, we made sure all our gear was ready, including a rifle for each of us, and just in time. Darkness enveloped Smithfield Lake. Visibility plummeted and the haunting silence grew thicker. Suddenly, there was a loud crack in the nearby bushes that jolted our senses into high alert. James whispered urgently, Marcus, something's out there. I strained my eyes in the dark but could only make out a vague figure lumbering toward us with a menacing gait. Bulky and hunched over at the shoulders, its skin had an unnatural gray hue. Long arms ending in sharp claws swung uncontrollably beside massive legs with powerful muscles rippling underneath its otherworldly hide. 
All I could think was that it appeared to be some freakishly mutated predator born from nature's darkest corners. It seemed unfathomable that such a creature existed, let alone lurking by an old standing simple lake like Smithfield. With my heart pounding mercilessly in my chest, I cocked my gun and aimed towards the creature that stood barely visible in front of me. You want to hear a funny joke? snorted James while gritting his teeth nervously. Not now. I snapped back at him as we braced ourselves for whatever gruesome and terrifying fate lay ahead against this monstrous adversary. In an instant, the creature lunged toward us. James fired first, the deafening sound of his gunfire filling the night. I fired as well, my heart pounding madly in my ears. We couldn't afford to miss or be caught off guard. The bullet seemed to slow the creature momentarily, but it continued to advance despite our desperate attempts to stop it. We had no choice but to retreat, not knowing if we could take it down or not. We need help. I yelled at James as we sprinted deeper into the dark woods, the sounds of the creature following closely behind. But there's no signal for... James stopped short and pointed to a small cabin in the distance, barely visible through the dense trees. Go! I urged him. We scrambled through the underbrush and reached the door, breathless and terrified. The cabin appeared abandoned, but that didn't matter right now. We needed shelter. As I struggled to unlatch the door, James looked frantically for any sign of weapons or tools in case we had to confront the creature again. He found an axe leaning against the dusty old cabinet and grabbed it, while I finally managed to open the door just as heavy footsteps drew closer. We hid on opposite sides of the cabin, waiting silently for what felt like an eternity. The door creaked open slowly and a tense whisper broke through. Marcus? James? It was Sarah, our fellow ranger who we informed about Smithfield Lake earlier. Cautiously, we stepped out of our hiding spots and embraced her with relief. We need to get out of here, I told Sarah urgently. There's some sort of creature after us that we can't seem to kill. Sarah took in our disheveled appearances and led us out of the cabin back through the thick foliage towards civilization. Okay, but let's go slow, she said firmly. It might have given up on chasing us. As we made our way through the woods cautiously, it seemed like an eternity before we finally emerged from the forest onto a dirt road leading back towards town, staying together as a group for protection against unseen threats. We walked in silence while pondering the horrors we had barely escaped. Once we reached the main road, we decided to flag down an oncoming car for help. The driver, recognizing that we were in distress, quickly got out to offer assistance. We explained our situation without going into gory details of the creature. We knew it would be difficult for anyone to believe us without evidence. Realizing that help couldn't arrive quickly enough, the driver offered to drive us back to town and contact the appropriate authorities. We gratefully accepted his help and climbed into his vehicle, exhausted but thankful for this small saving grace. As we drove away from Smithfield Lake, I glanced back at the cabin one last time, my heart sinking as plans of our future expeditions evaporated before my eyes. James held his axe tight as we continued on our way, grateful not only for this stranger's assistance but also for the solidarity between us. Whatever happened out there in those woods would remain etched in our memories forever, a chilling episode that bonded us together. When we finally returned to town and reported our findings, no one was quite sure what to make from our account of a monstrous creature. Despite initial skepticism from some skeptical officials, they agreed to send a search team to investigate the area around Smithfield Lake, armed with their own rifles and protective gear. A few days later, when the team returned empty-handed, I couldn't help but feel a nagging confusion. 
if there were no signs of the creature left behind, what had attacked us? Were there more like it out there? And if so, where would they strike next? James and I remained close as each grisly memory from that night began to fade. Though many aspects of that harrowing encounter would remain unexplained and unknown, there was one thing that had been made painfully clear. Whatever it was that lurked near Smithfield Lake now held a chilling and powerful presence over us all. As for Sarah, she was unable to find it in herself to return to her post as a ranger or even set foot anywhere near the woods again. The memories of that night haunted her every step, and she eventually relocated to another part of the country, vowing never to revisit the site of her worst nightmares. I bumped my knee on the corner of the desk for the millionth time. Better watch out, Harris, that desk's out to get you, chuckled my teammate, Owen Nielsen. As a Navy SEAL, I, Harris Dunbar, was used to high-stress situations, but that little bump always put me in a foul mood. The smell of coffee filled the air as our team settled in, preparing for today's briefing. Special projects were our forte and each mission raised new challenges. This time, we were heading to an unassuming town right outside of Salem, Oregon. High-ranked officials had disappeared near a hidden research facility in the area. Our intel suggested that something strange hunted those woods, animalistic and cunning. The few witnesses described it as having elongated limbs and razor-sharp claws capable of tearing through metal with astonishing ease. The team geared up and drove off in silence. We arrived at the edge of the forest and parked our SUVs off the road. As we ventured into the woods towards an abandoned cabin where the murders took place, Owen tried lightening the mood with some jokes. What do you call a Navy SEAL who can't swim? Dead weight. He snickered while Andy Clark, another teammate of ours, rolled her eyes. Upon arrival at the cabin, I noticed claw marks on the door and bent hinges. It seemed to have been forced open by something powerful. We entered cautiously, weapons raised, aiming to secure this piece of critical evidence. Why would this thing target high-ranking officials? Pondered Owen aloud. Maybe it doesn't like their power suits, replied Andy smirking. As we progressed through the barely lit cabin, searching for clues about our elusive antagonists' whereabouts or motives, each step amplified tension amongst us. We found remains scattered on blood-soaked floors, truly a grisly scene not for weak stomachs. Didn't expect to see that after breakfast, commented Andy dryly. Despite the terrible sight, her casual tone helped our team in maintaining a cool head. We reported back to base and decided to set up camp nearby. After all, our primary objective was still far from accomplished. I recalled the creature's description provided by the witnesses. Its elongated limbs were mentioned repeatedly. Night crept upon us quickly, darkness engulfing our surroundings. We took turns keeping watch as the temperature significantly dropped. I struggled to stay awake during my turn, eyes heavy with fatigue. An unnatural noise disturbed my struggling thoughts. It started faintly, unidentifiable among rustling leaves, gradually growing louder until it became unmistakable, footsteps heading directly toward our camp. Moments later, a blur of movement caught my peripheral vision, a flash of elongated limbs standing tall. This sudden appearance confirmed that we were dealing with a creature we knew nothing about and were ultimately unprepared for. Andy! Owen! Wake up! It's here! I shouted to no avail. They were down for the count. But why? How fast had it struck? I raised my rifle but hesitated. What if it wasn't enough to kill or subdue this creature? 
The clamor of my roused teammates responding to my shouts grew prominent in the thick air, igniting equal determination and fear in our hearts as we faced the beast. The creature towered above us, its elongated limbs ending in razor-sharp claws. Its eyes were two black voids that bored into us with a calculated malevolence. It was clear the creature sought to kill us, for reasons we still did not know, and now it had us cornered in our camp. Andy Owen, we need to leave now, I urged, watching the creature circle us as I tried to evaluate our chances of survival. We didn't have the luxury of calling for help since our radio was damaged in an earlier scuffle with this thing. The three of us hastily backed away, careful not to turn our backs on the predator that now stalked us. Its massive form moved with grace and purpose. It seemed to be displaying its prowess to ensure we knew it was the superior being in our standoff. The sight of such raw strength was truly horrifying. I realized that there had been an opportunity to call for help when Andy managed to shoot flares into the sky earlier. However, I failed to take advantage of it as I had been too preoccupied with fear and confusion. The guilt weighed heavily upon me as my friends faced imminent danger due to my negligence. As we continued our retreat, I stumbled upon an idea. Andy, Owen, we need to split up. Maybe one of us can draw its attention away from the others, I suggested, hoping that doubling back might by some time or create an opportunity for escape. Andy was quick to agree. She held out her weapon and glanced worriedly at Owen, who nodded solemnly before taking off in a separate direction. With a deep breath, we darted in different directions and immediately made as much noise as possible hoping this would confuse or disorientate the creature. The ensuing chaos was both terrifying and exhilarating, each team member running for dear life in different directions while hearing guttural screeches from the creature, not knowing if they were destined to receive its next blow or experience a narrow escape. For what seemed like eternity, I raced through the darkness, hearing nothing but my own breath and footsteps. But then it struck. An agonized scream echoed in the night, one which I instantly recognized as Owen's. Cursing myself for suggesting this plan, I fell upon a sense of dread that Owen's sacrifice would be in vain as the others struggled to get away from this relentless monster. My instincts told me to regroup with Andy while we could and find a means to combat this beast. Miraculously, we found each other amidst all the panic. We gave each other a sorrowful glance acknowledging our friend's ultimate sacrifice before continuing. We kept moving until we spotted an abandoned cabin close by, which we sought refuge in. We barricaded the entrance with any objects we could muster and began crafting makeshift weapons. No radio could aid us in our dire situation, but perhaps some ingenuity and desperation might see us through. While preparing for our inevitable confrontation, Andy noticed a peculiar attribute about the creature. Did you see its reaction to fire earlier when I shot those flares? It seemed to hesitate. She whispered. Her observation provided me hope, now armed with knowledge of a potential weakness that we were quick to exploit. Fashioning torches out of whatever resources the cabin provided, we steeled ourselves for the impending attack. The moment arrived. I held my breath tightly as the door creaked painfully at first, then snapped open in a sudden explosion of splintered wood and shattered hinges. The creature lunged inside hungrily, only to be met by Andy and me brandishing our flaming torches defiantly. The reaction was immediate. It hissed in pain and reared back covering its face with its terrible claws. Driven by fear and the loss of our dear friend, we refused to back down, relentlessly pushing forward with our makeshift weapons. Burning hot and bright, we managed to drive it back, scoring hits to its vulnerable body. Our efforts were rewarded with yet another chorus of anguished screeching as it then fled from our humble sanctuary. 
Although exhausted and injured, we looked into each other's eyes, not knowing if we had finally escaped the creature's grasp or if it would soon return for retribution. All we could do now was remember Owen and his selfless act while continuing this life or death struggle and hopefully make our way towards safety. I had just bitten into my favorite sandwich from that corner deli when the call came, cutting through the pleasantries of lunchtime banter. My name is James Kolinsky, and I'm a Navy SEAL. In one swift motion, I pushed my plate aside and answered the phone. Kolinsky, my superior barked on the other end. We've got a situation near Seattle. Our intel hints at something sinister, something non-human. You leave in one hour. As a highly trained operative, I couldn't afford to waste time asking questions. I threw out my sandwich and hit the road en route to Seattle. Our team rendezvoused at an isolated cabin near Mount Rainier National Park, as remote and eerie as could be. The campground hosts have been going missing, said Agent Sanchez, clutching his coffee mug and trying to thaw his fingers by our makeshift fire pit. So far, eight people are unaccounted for and presumed dead. What are we dealing with here? I inquired. Agent Ramirez responded, voice trembling with fear. Some special ops found dismembered bodies at murder scenes scattered around these woods. She shuddered. Not just people either. Animals too, bears even, mangled beyond recognition. We huddled closer to the fire as our mission unfolded before us locate the creature responsible for these crimes and stop it once and for all. How do you make a tissue dance? Whispered Agent Jenkins, suddenly softening the tension with a well-timed joke. How? Our group chimed in almost simultaneously. You put a little boogie in it declared Jenkins triumphantly. Laughter filled the freezing night air for an instant before serious expressions returned to our faces. As we combed through the dense foliage over weeks, a definite pattern emerged. Fresh blood trails led us deeper into the heart of the park. We found gruesome sights, mangled corpses among uprooted trees. And then, in a dark crevice, we found it the villain, the monster, Covered head to toe in scales and bristling with spikes, the creature stood at least ten feet tall. Rows of razor-sharp teeth filled its elongated snout. Saliva dripped from its maw, and its sickly yellow eyes seemed to emit a malicious glee as it fixed us in its gaze. Kalinsky! Ramirez! shouted Agent Jenkins, who opted for diversion tactics. Get some distance and flank it! As we cautiously backed away from the beast, guns raised and aimed at the monster's midsection, my foot caught on a fallen branch. The crack echoed through the forest like gunfire. In an instant, it lunged at us with breathtaking speed. Agent Sanchez and I rolled to opposite sides of the pathway, narrowly escaping the snapping jaws that descended upon us with an earth-shattering crunch. We scrambled to our feet and instinctively opened fire on the creature, with bullets impacting its scaled body. It roared in pain but didn't slow down instead, it charged toward Kalinsky, its massive claws swiping through the air. Kalinsky! I shouted in warning, but it was too late. The creature's claws slashed through his torso with sickening ease, causing him to fall to the ground, mortally wounded. Even though I wanted to help him, there wasn't time. Survival came first. Jenkins was sprinting toward a suitable stage for a final standoff. We didn't bother calling for help. We knew no one could reach us in time in these remote woods. And if we were honest with ourselves, we didn't think anyone would believe the story of the monster that hunted us. Ramirez fired at the beast as it pursued us relentlessly through the forest. 
Its sickly yellow eyes narrowed as it closed the gap between us, eager to claim more victims. Between the snapping branches and deafening gunfire, our surroundings became a chaotic cacophony of noise. We finally reached a clearing where Jenkins came up with a quick plan. The creature continued its pursuit, seemingly unfazed by any injuries we had inflicted upon it. It was determined and relentless in its hunt. As it lunged toward me again saliva dripping from those razor-sharp teeth I managed to sidestep its attack just in time for Sanchez and Ramirez to open fire from opposite angles simultaneously. Blood spurted from the beast as our well-executed plan staggered it momentarily. Don't let up, Jenkins shouted, urging us to keep fighting even as exhaustion threatened to overtake us all. There had been so many deaths already. We couldn't allow this monster to claim anyone else. In an act of desperation or cunning, or perhaps both, Sanchez stepped forward and clutched a lit flare in his hand. As the creature lunged toward him with vicious intent, he hurled the flare at its face, igniting a spark in the air. The resulting explosion not only threw the monster back but also set fire to its scales. The unbearable screeching that followed revealed that the creature felt fear and pain just as we did. Eventually, between our continuous gunfire and the steady burn of the fire on its body, it took one last raspy breath before collapsing to the ground. Sanchez panted heavily, barely having time to dodge out of harm's way after throwing that fateful flare. We exchanged looks of disbelief we'd actually managed to take down the murderous beast. We stood there for a moment, catching our breath and carnage left by our fight. We had lost Kolinsky, whose body lay unmoving not far from the fallen beast. The pang of guilt was sharp. He had been a good agent, and even a better friend. In that cleared area littered with the aftermath of destruction, we knew we had a duty to those whose lives had been lost. Kolinsky and all those who had died so gruesomely at the hands of this monster. Still panting with adrenaline pumping through our veins, Jenkins picked up his radio and called for an extraction team and backup. They needed to know what happened here, both for them and for all those who had fallen prey to this creature in these woods. We gathered near our fallen comrade and waited for help to arrive solemnly paying homage to Kolinsky while knowing that his tragic sacrifice had made it possible for us to eliminate such a blight on this once serene landscape. As helicopters approached from a distance, I looked around me at my fellow agents, tired but determined men and women who were no strangers to encounters with unfathomable evil. I understood something now, no matter how deep into darkness we ventured or monstrous the adversary we faced, we would always face it together. And that unity made us stronger than anything these woods could throw at us. I was grabbing my usual cup of coffee before starting a top-secret mission, you know, the kind we Navy SEALs are trained for. Just make sure you come back in one piece, Rick Montgomery, said the cafe owner, Reggie, with a laugh. Little did I know then that this mission would change my life forever. My team and I had been assigned to investigate a series of murders in the swamplands of Louisiana. We chose a cabin on the outskirts of New Orleans as our base where the murky bayous seemed to hold their breath in anticipation. We'd heard whispers amongst the locals about an enigmatic creature stalking the swamps. Only they knew it by its unique claw prints. One day, we tracked down a rugged fisherman named Ollie Perkins, who claimed to have seen the monster's handiwork up close. Sporting a thick accent, he said, It ain't like anything you've seen before. Ain't no alligator na like that. He held up photographs, and I could see what he meant. The victims were brutally mangled but with a surgical precision that was almost eerie. 
As a team of highly trained and skilled professionals, we took precautions while venturing into the bayous at nightfall with our specialized equipment. Canoes, night vision goggles, firearms locked and loaded. However, we weren't prepared for the unsettling atmosphere as darkness cast shadows in every direction. Sweat dripping off our faces, we exchanged serious looks while gliding through thick mangroves and moss-draped trees. I can tell you one thing, combat training never made me feel like this. Chuckling nervously, one teammate whispered, Hey Rick, why don't cannibals eat comedians? Cause they taste funny. The laughter died when we heard something splashing in the water nearby. Ripples spread outward from an unknown source. We tensed, assessing the situation. My heart was pounding against my chest, tightly gripping my firearm. As the disturbance in the water drew closer to us, I finally saw it. This thing had sharp, twisted horns that looked like they could slice through metal. Its skin was a mix of scales and patches of fur, reflecting moonlight through the trees. It had long limbs with hands and feet that ended in razor-sharp claws. Drool dripped from its tooth-laden maw as it seemed to smile at us. This creature radiated an aura we never encountered before. A chill ran down my spine as panic began to set in. We tried calling for help but our radios emitted nothing but static, a sign we were truly on our own. Determined to confront the beast, we readied ourselves for combat. Our strategies carefully planned, our weapons primed for action, this was it. Every ounce of fear transformed into focus and resolve as adrenaline surged through our veins. As we faced the gruesome creature, my teammate Jeff suddenly cried out, Fall back! Get to the canoes! We wasted no time hesitating. This thing was unlike anything we had ever encountered, and survival instincts kicked in. Our team quickly began to retreat to the boats when the creature charged at us with incredible speed. In a horrifying display of power, it grabbed at one of my teammates, Tom, and dragged him away into the darkness. Horrified by Tom's fate, we sprinted faster than ever towards our canoes. I could hear my teammates heavy breathing as our pounding feet propelled us forward in sheer terror. The creature let out a guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. In that moment, I knew it wasn't done hunting us. As we neared the canoes, our team leader Rick shouted, Spread out! Make it harder for it to target us! We followed his orders and split off in different directions towards the water. I was gasping for breath by the time I reached one of the canoes. I flipped it over and jumped in as fast as possible. Grasping my paddle, I pushed myself away from the shore in an attempt to distance myself from that monstrous beast. My teammates tried to do the same, each fighting their own adrenaline-filled nerves as they raced for safety. Suddenly, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I heard a blood-curdling scream pierce through the night air. I looked around frantically and saw Sarah being attacked by the creature. It had stealthily snuck up on her as she was trying to launch her canoe into the water. The sight of her lifeless body sent a wave of nausea coursing through me. A sob broke free from my throat as another teammate shouted at me from a nearby canoe. Come on. Let's get out of here. Knowing there was nothing more we could do for Sarah, I kept paddling alongside the surviving members of my team. Tears streamed down our faces as we escaped the nightmarish scene behind us. We paddled tirelessly through the night, desperate to put as much distance as possible between us and that predator. The static from our radio still rendered them useless. Our only hope lay in getting back to civilization and reporting to our superiors. Finally, on the verge of collapsing from exhaustion, our battered team reached a familiar outpost. We were greeted with a mix of relief and disbelief by our colleagues who had feared for our lives. 
While being treated for injuries resulting from our harrowing experience, we were forced to recount the ghastly events to our superiors. I couldn't bring myself to look at my remaining teammates. The guilt and sorrow were too much to bear as we mourned the loss of Tom and Sarah. As daylight broke, we learned that aerial searches had been conducted during the night, and that additional help was on its way. But no trace of Tom, Sarah, or the creature was found in the murky depths of the bayou. In the aftermath of our traumatic encounter, I constantly tried to make sense of what happened out there, of what that creature truly was. I found no solace or answers, just haunting memories of a monster unlike any beast known to man. The image of Tom being dragged away would forever be seared into my mind, while Sarah's screams echoed endlessly in my nightmares. Despite surviving that hellish night in the bayou, we all knew life would never be quite as it was before. As time wore on and adrenaline subsided, I painstakingly reminded myself that regardless of what we faced that night in the bayou, there simply are some horrors that will remain unsolved, and perhaps they're better left that way. I downed the last of my cold, bitter coffee, glancing around the crowded diner in the quaint town of Woodsville, New Hampshire. My name is Jack Marsden, and as a Navy SEAL on assignment, I had no idea that this seemingly ordinary day would take a dark turn. Across from me sat Cooper McKnight, my trusted partner and fellow SEAL. Did you hear that one about the chicken who walked into the diner? Cooper asked with a grin. The jokes he cracked always eased the pressure we faced on our secret missions. No, tell me, I replied with feigned interest. Well, he continued, the chicken said, give me all your eggs, or else. I grinned at his lame joke as we got ready to begin our work at this remote location. Operation Blackwater was a reconnaissance mission to gather intelligence on an elusive criminal organization. It appeared that this group had links to gruesome and unexplained deaths in real-life places in the USA. Our first lead led us to Woodsville, a small New Hampshire town nestled between dense forests and hills. The town seemed like any other American community at first glance. Yet beneath its idyllic facade lay thick layers of fear. These were not ordinary criminals. They operated in secrecy and were connected to unspeakable acts of violence. As Cooper and I walked down Main Street, we approached an elderly couple walking their dogs. Good morning. I greeted them with a friendly smile. Morning. They replied hesitantly, clearly uncomfortable in our imposing presence. We continued our surveillance and subtly gathered information from folks around town. Our objective was clear, to find clues that might lead us to the sinister force responsible for these chilling crimes. As dusk enveloped Woodsville, we prepared to investigate an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. This site had been flagged as a potential nexus of criminal activity by our superiors. We have to be cautious, Jack. Cooper warned. The factory reeked of decay and desolation. It was a dark and decaying monument to the death of industry. Entering cautiously, we surveyed our surroundings, our expert military training guiding us through the silent building. Our flashlights swept through the darkness as we navigated the factory's decaying structure. Broken windows allowed the moonlight to pierce through and create a mosaic of shadows. Suddenly, we heard an inhuman growl echoing through the empty corridors. The sound sent shivers down our backs. Cooper and I exchanged a concerned glance, unsure of the source. Should we call for backup? I asked him, gripping my flashlight tightly. No, he responded without a second thought. We can't afford to wait. We need to find out what's happening now. The growls grew louder and more terrifying, 
causing us to brace for a possible encounter with whatever unspeakable horror was lurking within the abandoned factory. As we turned a corner, our flashlights revealed an animalistic creature standing at the end of a deserted hallway. It was tall and muscular with pitch black fur covering its entire body, its yellow eyes shining menacingly in the darkness. Long claws extended from its large hands, dripping with blood. The sight of this grotesque monster filled us with dread. We weren't equipped or prepared for something like this. Our mission was to gather intelligence on human criminals, not face off against monstrous creatures. But there was no time to hesitate. We needed to evade capture by this creature or risk losing our lives. Never looking back, we sprinted away from it and into another hallway, praying that it hadn't noticed us. Thanks to our military training, we were able to maneuver around the building quickly while staying as quiet as possible. But just when we thought we had lost it, we once again encountered that horrifying creature stalking us from behind. The beast lunged forward, swiping its deadly claws at Cooper's leg. He yelped in pain but miraculously managed to keep moving. I knew that if we slowed down for even a second, this monster would tear us apart. Our only hope now was to escape the factory and find help. As we stumbled out of the building into the night, despair gripped us. There was no cellular reception in this remote location, making it impossible to call for backup. All alone and with an injured partner, we were left to fend off this creature that seemed hell-bent on relentlessly pursuing us. Cooper's leg was bleeding profusely now, and I could see his resolve waning as we struggled to keep moving. In the distance, I spotted a nearby cabin shrouded in darkness, perhaps a temporary respite from our relentless pursuer. With adrenaline coursing through our veins, we made a desperate break for the cabin. Once inside, we barricaded the door with whatever furniture we could find before collapsing onto the floor, our fear temporarily outweighing Cooper's pain. We need to figure out how to kill this thing. He managed between gasps for air. It won't stop until it gets what it wants us. I nodded, knowing full well that our chances were slim. But if we wanted to leave Woodsville alive, we needed to put an end to this nightmare. For days, Cooper and I improvised devices to aid in our fight, while desperately trying to stay ahead of the monstrous creature constantly on our tail. Despite his injuries and fatigue depleting their strength, Cooper never wavered in his commitment to our survival. Alas, during a final showdown with the beast in an isolated clearing under moonlit skies, Cooper was struck by one of its savage claws. He died instantly, a powerful reminder that humanity cannot always prevail against such ruthless forces of darkness. Miraculously, I managed to escape. Back in civilization, I reminisced about my brave companion who had sacrificed his life so that I could tell our story. Though my heart will always mourn Cooper's loss, I knew that I had also found strength in his spirit, a spirit that would carry me through the rest of my days. I was sitting in a dimly lit room with my fellow Navy SEALs, reviewing the details of a top-secret mission deep in some undisclosed location in Nevada. The atmosphere was tense as Commander Silas Crane briefed us on our task. My name is Matthias King, and I had no idea what was waiting for me during this mission. We've received intel that something's been brutally killing people around here. Commander Crane said in his gruff voice. We have no further information on the perpetrator, but I want you all on top of your game for this one. My colleague Lennox Wyatt chuckled. With us together on this case, I would bet we'll have everything solved before lunchtime. He joked, anything to lighten the mood. Our team made our way toward the crime scene, stepping over dry brush and moving through the arid landscape. 
Upon reaching the site, we realized that what we found there wasn't going to be simple, for bodies were brutally mangled and torn apart beyond recognition. As we began examining the bodies for any clues, an agitated voice crackled through our radios. Guys, you need to see this. It was our teammate who sold Hale. We rushed over to her location and found her staring at something imprinted in the dirt. Looking down at the ground, I noted fresh tracks that resembled massive paw prints ending in razor-sharp claws. The tracks weren't anything I'd ever seen before or even heard of. They were monstrous. We need to identify these prints and figure out what animal is responsible, said Olivia Quinton, our best tracker. As we continued our investigation, we couldn't shake off a feeling of being watched. At some point, Lennox whispered nervously, Anyone else getting a little too creeped out by whatever might be lurking around? We spent days examining the area around the prints, strange mutilated carcasses of native animals, the eerie silence that seemed to swallow up our voices. We tried reaching out to locals for any information they might have about supernatural, monstrous beings or legends, but no one was talking. Then one night, as we camped out under the clear desert sky, we heard a deep, guttural growl emanating from the darkness. Our hands flew to our guns as we cautiously scanned the desolate landscape. Suddenly, something massive lunged at Lennox in the dim moonlight. The creature's hand was armored with scales, its enormous body covered in thick hide and tufts of coarse fur. Snarling through rows of jagged teeth, it grabbed Lennox and began to flee into the night. The creature moved surprisingly fast for its size. It sprinted off into the darkness like a well-oiled machine. I chased after them, my heart hammering in my chest. Our radios were buzzing with chaos as our team struggled to keep up. We immediately formed a plan to retrieve Lennox from the creature's grasp. Olivia tried to track the creature by following broken branches and signs of disturbances in the ground. Isolde contacted the rest of our team and requested backup, but explained that we needed to act quickly and couldn't afford to wait for reinforcements. We moved swiftly, adrenaline flooding our veins. The moonlight cast eerie shadows as we navigated through the desolate landscape. Our minds raced thinking about Lennox's condition and what this mysterious creature might do to him. With each passing minute, I felt more desperate for answers. Yet in our pursuit, we remained cautious. The horrifying image of the creature burned into our memories. As we followed the trail, we came across a narrow chasm in the earth, an entrance to an underground cave system. We exchanged glances, Knowing full well where this tunnel led us could be insanely dangerous. Nevertheless, there were no other traces visible on the surface, which made our next steps clear. Olivia guided us through the dark abyss. Her years of tracking experience helped navigate even in these adverse conditions. The cave was damp and filled with strange alien-like stalagmites and icy stalactites hanging above us like jagged teeth. Narrow passageways led to larger chambers with no signs of life except for some small insects scuttling away from our flashlight beams. As we delved deeper into the caves, I began to notice traces of blood splattered on the walls. This chilling sight only fueled our determination. Lennox needed us now more than ever. Finally, we found ourselves at a clearing within the labyrinthine cave system. In its center lay Lennox, battered and bloodied, but still alive. Surrounding him was a trampled area where a fierce struggle had taken place. Before we could reach him, however, the monstrous beast appeared out of shadowy corners, snarling and barreling towards us. We raised our weapons and fired, but the bullets seemed to only enrage it further. The animalistic creature was unlike anything we'd ever seen. It had a muscular humanoid body covered in thick, matted fur. On its back were monstrous wings, 
yet they appeared to be too damaged for flight. Claws the length of daggers protruded from its hands, and blood still fresh from its attack on Lennox stripped onto the cave floor. As it charged at us once more, I realized calling for help was futile. No one would be able to reach us in time. Our bullets did little but slow the creature down momentarily as it continued advancing. Realizing our strategies were fruitless, Isolde grabbed flares from her backpack, activating them with a loud hiss. She hurled them at the creature, sending blinding light erupting through the cave chamber. The beast recoiled, shielding its sensitive eyes from the bright flare. Seizing this opportunity, we hurried over to Lennox and pulled him to safety. The fire from the flares spread rapidly throughout the dry brush in the cavern, filling it with heat and smoke that made it hard to breathe. With labored breaths, we dragged Lennox back through the network of tunnels retracing our steps and leaving behind the bellowing beast in a blaze of fire. As we stumbled out into the moonlit night, we glanced around at each other, bruised but alive. A cloud of smoke billowed out of the cave entrance behind us as we carried Lennox back towards our campsite. Once there, we tended to Lennox's injuries and radioed for extraction. The remainder of the night was filled with anxious silence as thinking about the horrors we had faced only hours earlier left us on edge. The arrival of our helicopter signaled that help had finally arrived, an end to this nightmare. We took one last look at the cave entrance, now buried under rubble from the fire's destruction. With heavy hearts, we boarded the helicopter and left behind a nightmarish experience that would haunt us for the rest of our lives. I had just finished my morning coffee when my team leader, Jonas Marconi, summoned us for a briefing. We were in an inconspicuous warehouse located in the outskirts of New Orleans. The musty odor of damp wood and corroded metal filled the air as we gathered around Marconi, who was holding a thick folder with photographs. All right, team, we've got ourselves an unusual mission, Marconi said, looking up from the folder. We've been called in to track down a highly dangerous suspect who's been eluding law enforcement for months. This creature is the prime suspect in a series of gruesome attacks on civilians. As a Navy SEAL, I'd dealt with many dangerous situations before, but this assignment seemed different. I could feel my pulse quickening with each piece of information Marconi shared. Dixon Bowles here. I introduced myself to newcomers in the team. Shrugging off their handshakes, I focused on the task at hand. The photographs showed the aftermath of the attacks. The victims' bodies were covered in strange lacerations that I couldn't quite make out. What kind of animal or thing could do this? I asked myself aloud as we examined the images more closely. One of our teammates, Paula Tanaka, raised her eyebrows at me. It's like something out of a horror movie. She joked nervously. Marconi continued with the briefing. So far, we have limited information about the creature's whereabouts and nature. Witness accounts are too hard to believe. Your mission is to gather evidence and track down this creature before it kills again. The sun was beginning its descent as our team split up to canvas the surrounding area swamps, industrial sites, and abandoned buildings. My partner for this mission was Winston Paulson, an expert tracker who had been following leads on this case for months. During our search, Winston suddenly whispered, Over there, pointing towards a patch of torn cloth hanging from a tree branch. It matches the description of what one of the victims was wearing. We advanced cautiously, our eyes surveying the muddy terrain and overgrown foliage for any clues. We noticed deep gashes into the tree trunks, claw marks suggesting a large, powerful animal. Man, what kind of steroids is this creature taking? I joked to Winston, 
attempting to lighten the mood. Suddenly, we heard rustling in the brush nearby. Our hearts raced. We readied our weapons and crept closer. The branches parted, revealing an armadillo. We shared an embarrassed laugh. You know Jonas was pranking us about this whole monster thing, right? I teased Winston. He looked at me seriously, his eyes never wavering from their investigation through the dense forest. You didn't see those photos, he replied grimly. This is definitely not a joke. As darkness enveloped us, we continued searching for more clues when we stumbled upon an old shack hidden deep in the swamp's heart. Carefully opening the door, we found something that sent shivers down our spines. The floor was covered in bloodstains of varying ages and the remnants of bones not clean. No doubt about it, this is where that thing feeds, whispered Winston. My radio crackled as Marconi's voice came through. Everyone regroup at the warehouse immediately. We've found its lair. Moments later, we gathered back at our base of operations as Marconi explained. We received intel that led us to an old warehouse near Lake Pontchartrain. It was filled with evidence pointing to the creature's life and activities. Marconi shared photos of a secluded chamber within the warehouse containing mangled tools covered in blood and dried viscera. We're dealing with something cunning and lethal here. Marconi warned us. Be prepared for the worst. We geared up feeling the weight of our armor and weaponry as we approached the warehouse. Every step felt heavier as we neared the entrance. We'll go in teams, Marconi instructed. Bowles and Winston approach from the back. Paula and I will infiltrate through the front. Bowles and Winston disappeared behind the warehouse, while Paula and Marconi made their way towards the front entrance. I thought about calling for help, but it seemed like we had the situation under control. We had a plan, after all. Besides, no one would believe us if we told them what we'd found. The door creaked open as Marconi cautiously stepped into the darkness, followed by Paula and me. The warehouse was massive, with rows of abandoned crates and machinery from an old factory. The smell of decay in the air was overwhelming, making it difficult to breathe. We moved cautiously forward, sticking together in a tight group. That's when we heard it, heavy breathing from deep within the shadows. The sound sent a shiver down my spine, but I didn't dare express my fear. Suddenly, the creature lunged at us from its hiding spot within the darkness. Its appearance was all too real a twisted combination of human and animal features, its muscular body covered in matted fur and adorned with razor-sharp claws gleaming under the pale moonlight streaming through a broken window. Marconi managed to shoot at it before being swept aside with a powerful swipe of the abomination's arm. He crashed against a stack of crates several meters away. Paula screamed and tried to run but was quickly cut off by the creature's swift movements. I wanted to scream too, maybe call for help this time, but I couldn't muster any sound. I could only watch in horror as the relentless monster pursued Paula throughout the warehouse. It finally cornered her amidst tall stacks of crates. Panicking, she shouted for Marconi or anyone else who could hear her, pleading for assistance. The creature slowly approached her pinned body, its cruel eyes glinting as it bared its teeth in anticipation, ready to tear her apart with ease. Suddenly, Bowles and Winston burst through a side door, guns blazing. The creature shrieked in pain as bullets lodged into its monstrous body, knocking it to the ground. Seizing the moment, I scrambled towards the fallen Marconi grateful to find him unconscious but alive. I shook him awake and shouted that we had to flee. As a group, we frantically made our way to the warehouse exit with the howls and snarls of the injured beast echoing behind us. Upon reaching the edge of Lake Pontchartrain, 
we stumbled across a small motorboat. With no time for debate, we quickly loaded everyone onto the vessel and sped off. To this day, none of us have any intention of setting foot in that nightmarish place again. Though the memory haunts each of us, we remain committed to keeping it hidden, working tirelessly to safeguard our communities from those ruthless monsters that continue lurking in the shadows. The experience left us shaken while teaching us invaluable lessons. We learn never to dismiss cautionary tales or lose sight of our innocence when entering unfamiliar territory. It also solidified our understanding of courage and unity, standing united and facing challenges beyond comprehension. Those dark memories still cling to us. Marconi's injuries, Paula's terror-stricken face during her pursuit, Bowles and Winston's timely arrival swooping in to save a life. A constant reminder of the night when five individuals ventured into a perilous world only to emerge battered and scarred but stronger than ever before. I sat at the kitchen table, sipping my morning coffee while waiting for my orders. My name is Oscar Pelton a Navy SEAL with more than a few missions under my belt. The ringing phone interrupted my thoughts, and I answered it with military precision. Oscar, we've got a situation here, said Commander Brownson. We need you at the Grand Canyon as soon as possible. Following a brief explanation of the mission, I was on my way. Hours later, I arrived at the site and met our team leader, Emmett Rooney. We found a mutilated body yesterday. You'll see it for yourself soon enough, he warned. In the distance stood Grand Canyon National Park in all its beauty deep ravines cut by Colorado River, majestic red walls of rock that changed color depending on the light. But today's mission offered little time to appreciate its splendor. My team approached the scene carefully. Sharp-eyed Frederica Ward spotted something unusual. There's blood on those rocks near the edge, she announced. We checked our weapons and proceeded with caution. The crime scene was gruesome. The body lay torn to pieces, evidence of a brutal attack by an unknown beast or creature. We collected what little evidence we had while trying not to think about what could have done this. Emmett spoke up. Do any of you know why ducks have feathers? With puzzled looks on our faces, we waited for his punchline. To cover their but quacks. After some eye-rolling and groaning, we went back to work, chatting quietly amongst ourselves. It seemed impossible to get too comfortable knowing something monstrous lurked nearby. As night fell and our search intensified, I overheard Iris Zelensky mention a strange-looking figure she noticed earlier in the week hiding behind some bushes. Suspicion grew when crossing paths with Brawny Park Ranger Malachi Grove who'd seen an ominous creature he described as a massive blur of fur and great speed. But we kept our focus on the case at hand. Unaware of the increasing danger, we continued to joke around. Iris tried to brighten things up by asking, Why don't scientists trust atoms? She grinned. Because they make up everything. Night pressed in, and we had no choice but to set up camp. Huddled around a small fire, we tried to make sense of our strange circumstances. Talks soon turned to local legends and hushed whispers about the Skinwalker, a fearsome shapeshifter believed by Native American tribes to inhabit the region. Suddenly, a chilling scream echoed through the canyon, unmistakably one of our team members. We grabbed our weapons and raced towards the sound. It didn't take us too long to reach Edgar Buckley's lifeless body in a clearing. His face contorted as if experiencing unimaginable pain before succumbing to death. The attacker was gone without a trace except for the gore lingering like silent witnesses. Oscar, this is beyond anything we've faced before. Emmett stammered before instructing everyone to return to camp with haste. 
As we retraced our steps guns in hand, my hair stood on end. This was not an ordinary criminal nor an animal attack. Something unnatural threatened our lives. I recalled my training, assess surroundings, rely on instinct, protect our team at all costs. Without warning, I caught a glimpse of it from the corner of my eye. A horrifying creature difficult to comprehend in its full repugnance, enormous with twisted antlers like tree branches sprouting from its head, long limbs lined with razor-sharp claws and matted fur stained with crimson from fresh kills. The beast lunged towards us without hesitation or fear, one swipe sending Emmett flying against nearby rocks with a sickening crunch. Frederica fired at the creature, but it barely reacted to our weapons. Our team scrambled in panic as we tried to regroup, shots echoing around the landmark canyon. As the creature continued its onslaught, it became clear that we had no chance of defeating it on our terms. Our bullets barely made an impact, and our team's desperation grew with each passing second. Everyone, retreat! I shouted the order. Our primary concern now was getting out alive and alerting the authorities. I quickly pulled out my satellite phone to call for help. Helicopter evacuation needed ASAP. We're being attacked by an unknown creature. Through heavy breaths, we all began to make our way back to camp while fending off the beast's relentless aggression. It seemed to take pleasure in causing us pain, its glowing eyes filled with malice. At one point, Frederica stumbled and fell. I hauled her back onto her feet and screamed at everyone not to stop running no matter what. The idea of leaving Edgar's body behind was nauseating but necessary. We would have to retrieve him later once help arrived if we survived this nightmare. Once back at camp, we erected barriers with whatever we could find to keep the creature at bay rocks, branches, makeshift spears, anything. With beads of sweat pouring down our faces, we braced ourselves for another attack. But something changed in the creature. It simply stood at a distance watching us and pacing back and forth like a predator observing its prey. Every so often, it let out a guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Mariana suddenly noticed her bleeding hand from a defensive wound earlier. The creature seemed fixated on her blood. In fear or insanity, even she couldn't tell she grabbed a stone knife and sliced deeper into her palm before stepping out into the open ground. Fingers trembling from pain or bravery unknown in such instances, she smeared her blood across a tree trunk as bait. She barely had time to scuttle back inside our makeshift fortress before the creature charged at the tree, tearing it apart with its ferocious claws. The momentary distraction had bought us valuable time. Above, the roar of helicopter blades provided hope as our rescuers arrived. We threw flares to signal our location, knowing there was a chance they wouldn't see us in this vast, hellish landscape. As the monster clashed against the barriers we had erected, they began to crumble under its immense strength. The creature's attention wavered between us and the ruinous noise of the helicopter. The thin line between life and death rested in these dwindling seconds. The helicopter swooped down low, piloted by a brave soul who seemingly knew the stakes at play. As one by one, we climbed aboard its lifeline ladder. I dared not look back at the creature below. Thankfully, it did not pursue us as we soared into the sky perhaps disoriented by the noise or satisfied with ending its terror at reclaiming Edgar's life. We left this dreadful place a wounded team in body and spirit shaken to our core by the bloodlust of an unknown creature who had taken one of our own from us. The authorities would need to be informed about this monster lurking in the canyon. Too many innocent lives were at stake if they were not alerted to its presence. In our escape to safety, I took one last look down at what I hoped would be put behind us forevermore. Could we hope for an end to the menace we faced that grisly night? As I pondered the future of that canyon's haunted secret, 
I prayed for some semblance of peace and justice for Edgar a team member fallen in a terrifying world beyond our comprehension. I had always loved the smell of coffee, and today was no exception as I sipped from my travel mug. My name is Ewan Hawkins, and I was stationed at Pearl Harbor which has its fair share of history. Stepping into the Navy SEAL base, I couldn't imagine that such a horrifying experience would be waiting for me. I reached our designated meeting spot where my fellow SEALs, Axel Thornton and Barry Holloway, were waiting. As I walked up to them, Axel shared some of his classic humor. Hey Ewan, what did one wall say to the other wall? He asked with a grin. I don't know Axel, what did it say? I responded. I'll meet you at the corner. Both Barry and Axel burst into laughter while exchanging high fives. Our team's mission was to extract vital intel from an underground facility near Fallon Range Training Complex in northern Nevada. The location had been specifically chosen due to its relative proximity to Area 5-1 and the secrecy that surrounded it. All right, team, said Barry. We need to make sure that we get in and out with minimal disturbance. We silently infiltrated the facility and fanned out to search for our objective. As we reached deeper into the unknown chambers and tunnels under a shroud of darkness, I snapped a photo of a partially scraped tail and bloodied claw marks on corridor walls. Axel whispered nervously into his radio. You and these marks on the walls, they look straight out of an animal's worst nightmare. I could only agree with him as the curiosity about this creature's identity plagued me. Moving cautiously, we followed the trail of destruction it had left behind all through the sprawling underground complex. Desperate to complete our mission unhindered, we used simple hand signals as our primary form of communication. However, within moments an ear-splitting shriek echoed through the tunnels. We froze hearts pounding in our ears, as I finally saw the creature making its presence known. The sinister creature stood nearly ten feet tall with razored teeth lining its gaping maw. Its black, scaled body quivered as it stalked toward us, flames licking up from underneath each footstep. Its eyes, cold black and bone-chilling, bore into my soul. Barry, I whispered into the radio. We've got a serious problem here. Stay behind me, Barry commanded, trying to maintain his composure as we stared at the monstrosity before us. He raised his gun, training it on the creature as it continued its unsettling approach. Axel and I glanced at each other, knowing that our weapons would likely be useless against this nightmare. We made a silent pact to leave it to our leader while we focused on completing the mission. As Barry fired control burst at the creature, its scaly skin seemed to recoil and absorb the bullets. However, it only slowed down momentarily before continuing towards us undeterred. I turned to Axel and communicated with minimal gestures that we needed to find a way out of here while Barry kept the abnormal beast preoccupied. Axel nodded in agreement as we sprinted down a nearby corridor instantly stumbling across a sealed vault containing valuable information. Knowing that time wasn't on our side, Axel worked quickly to crack the code while I kept watch for any signs of danger. The loud sound of gunfire echoed in the distance, signaling that our leader was doing his best to keep the frightening menace away from us. A momentary hush finally followed immediately followed by our worst fear being confirmed a blood-curdling scream reverberating through the deep recesses of the facility. Got it! Axel snapped me back to reality, having successfully opened the vault doors. We looked toward Barry's last known position before decisively entering the vault and initiated data extraction while feeling an overpowering sense of guilt for leaving him behind. 
monitoring any suspicious sound or movement as time crept by agonizingly slow, eventually confirming that we'd successfully acquired what we came for. Hearing rapid footsteps approach, adrenaline shot through our veins. But with precaution and relief we discovered an injured Barry approaching, barely escaping from certain death. It's persistent. We need to leave now. He warned shakily as he leaned against the wall for support. The creature had managed to injure him during their tense confrontation, leaving a deep gash on his leg. Wasting no time, our team quickly adjusted our escape plan, with Axel assisting Barry as we tried to retrace our steps amidst the unfamiliar underground maze. The eerie silence was unnerving, knowing full well what horrors could be lurking nearby. Moving cautiously, we suddenly sensed a shift in the atmosphere followed by increasingly louder growls behind us. We turned to see the nightmarish entity stalking us once again, refusing to let us leave its domain unscathed. Our desperation grew as we searched for an exit under immense pressure, while continuously evading the relentless pursuit of the monstrous creature. We couldn't afford to call for backup due to the facility's classified nature and risk exposing sensitive information. It was solely up to us to find a way out and survive this harrowing ordeal. Eventually, we stumbled upon an escape route a narrow ventilation shaft that led up and out of the facility. Our hearts pounding, we ascended through the tight tunnel one by one. Axel supporting Barry until finally breaking through to ground level just before the beast could reach us. Collapsing from exhaustion as daylight hit our skin, we reveled in our narrow escape but couldn't shake off the harrowing thought of what other terrors lurked beneath. We offered our condolences and expressed gratitude for each other's survival, while quietly mourning those who lost their lives to unthinkable horrors below new boundaries. As we reported back to headquarters with unease, questions lingered about where that bizarre creature originated from and what may have inspired its gruesome behavior. Our mission was a successful endeavor in terms of obtaining vital intelligence data but left us haunted by traumatic memories that would cunningly resurface during moments of short-lived peace. Ultimately, as soldiers, we continued embarking on various critical missions with heightened vigilance forever changed by the horrifying encounter with the monstrous abomination lurking within those forsaken depths. I walked into the dimly lit room, a familiar ache pulsing in my temples. Just another day at the office. I joked, trying to lighten the atmosphere. My name's Ramsey Kohler, by the way, and I'm a Navy SEAL. The room was located inside an obscure building in a remote area of Nevada. Our mission was simple, collect and analyze information from a high-value target. We had no idea that this mission would change everything we knew about our world. I scanned the faces of my team members, dedicated individuals like Joe Van Clausel and Amelini Wittishens. We had been through hell and back together, but we couldn't shake the feeling that today's task would test our mettle like never before. As we analyzed the data we'd intercepted, we found nothing out of the ordinary, at first. A chilling message suddenly stopped us in our tracks someone or something was plotting a gruesome, elaborate murder which, as it turned out, happened just days ago. Jovan shook his head in disbelief as he shared the details. How could anyone do that to another human being? He asked rhetorically. We knew it wasn't smart to dwell on this gruesome act. We needed to prepare for whatever nightmare awaited us. While outside, surveying the surrounding desert landscape through military-grade binoculars, I saw it for the first time. Hulking in stature and covered in mottled black scales that seemed to blend with shadows themselves, it moved with predatory precision toward an unsuspecting rabbit. In a split-second display of primal savagery, 
Its brutal symmetry caught hold of the small creature and tore it apart with sharp hooked claws on powerful limbs. My blood ran cold as I registered what I saw. No man or animal I knew could possess such anatomical weaponry. We looked at each other, shock and confusion swirling within us all. Instead of calling for help, we realized that getting the higher-ups involved would only lead them to doubting our sanity and competence. Our reputations, perhaps even our careers, hung in the balance. A good soldier trusts his instincts. We knew something monstrous was out there, so we prepared to face it on our own. Amelini quietly mustered up a weak joke to break the tension. Well, I guess we found the killer's inspiration. Despite our silent fear, her attempt at humor remembering that laughter is a brief reprieve from horror eased us a little. Nightfall loomed as we trudged through the dunes and ravines within Nevada's harsh desert. The few inhabitants of nearby towns locked their doors as cars lined roadsides. They moved with an urgency seldom found in these areas. Our target's lair was said to be in a cave deep within this desolate setting. Stalking down the narrow path into the cavern, our heart rates increased. The smell of decay and wet fur clawed at the back of our throats. Our flashlights refracted off shimmering walls that appeared unnaturally slick. We stepped into a chamber where mutilated carcasses lay scattered across damp rock. Prey and human remains indistinguishable from one another. The atmosphere tightened around us as distant scratching echoed through air thickened by death. Its approach was imminent. My hands were slick with sweat as I gripped my firearm tight, thumb tracing its contours while gears shifted my peripheral mind into focus. We huddled, breaths quivering as hearts beat wildly in prelude to an inevitable showdown. We knew we had to call for help, but the cave's deep recesses must have been interfering with our signal none of us could get through. Frustrated and anxious, we decided that one of us should return to the surface and send an SOS while the others stayed behind. I volunteered, knowing that I was the fastest among us. As I raced towards the entrance, I could hear my teammates discussing their plan behind me. Suddenly, a guttural growl ripped through the air, freezing me in my tracks. It seemed to come from all directions, making it impossible to pinpoint its origin. Terror coursed through my veins like ice as I realized that the creature had been waiting for us all along. I shouted a warning to those behind me and hesitated for only a moment before charging back to face the beast. As I stumbled into view, others were already positioning themselves, ready for an imminent assault. The creature's appearance matched its fearsome sounds, covered in matted fur and exuding a powerful musk. It stood on two legs with muscular arms that dangled alongside its twisted body. Its snout was elongated and filled with serrated, blood-stained teeth. Before any of us could react, it lunged at one of my teammates, Sarah. In an instant, razor-sharp claws tore through her body while she screamed, unable to move or defend herself against this relentless onslaught. We fired our weapons futilely as it seemed impervious to our bullets. Amalini roared in anger and charged towards the creature, driven by pure adrenaline and rage at witnessing her friend's brutal death. With futile desperation evident in her movements, she swung at the beast with her rifle managing to strike its face with unexpected force. The creature reeled but quickly recovered retaliating by backhanding Amelini so hard that she flew across the chamber before slamming into a wall. As caves rained, I spotted a sliver of hope, an opening into another cavern. Shouting for the others to follow, I made a desperate dash for it with the creature hot on my heels. We raced through narrow passages and over jagged rocks, all the while aware of the overwhelming power pursuing us. Finally, we entered a larger chamber where we could make our last stand. With our backs against the sheer rock wall and nowhere left to run, we readied ourselves for the inevitable onslaught. 
The beast entered snarling and thrashing its tail with unrestrained fury. Then, just as it was about to pounce, piercing sirens echoed through the cave, the sound of reinforcements on their way. Distracted by the noise, the creature hesitated for a moment which gave us enough time to unload every round left in our magazines directly towards its skull. It fell limp onto the floor with a deafening thud, black ichor oozing from its now lifeless form. Despite our freezing terror just moments before, relief washed over us as we realized that we had finally ended this nightmarish ordeal. In the end, rescue teams arrived and secured both us and what remained of the monstrous creature, taking it away for examination and offering condolences for our fallen comrade. Questions swirled around its origins and motives as we finally left that cursed place behind us. They would remain unanswered for now. Days passed and life resumed at an agonizingly slow pace. Reality sank in. Sarah was truly gone taken by unspeakable violence in those dark depths. But one thing is certain. Through our shared nightmare, we faced something that no training could have prepared us for together as comrades bound by loyalty that transcends fear itself. I remember gulping down the last few drops of my coffee before heading out to a secret mission. My name is Ezekiel Breckenridge, a Navy SEAL, trying to keep my country safe. A sense of unease crept into me as I entered the hidden facility located in a remote corner of Arizona. The heavy door closed behind me, enveloping the room in silence. Whispers echoed through the dimly lit hallway as I met up with my teammates. Smithson, a wise-cracking veteran, quipped, Hey Ezekiel, why don't skeletons fight each other? They don't have the guts. We all laughed momentarily forgetting our looming task. The mission seemed ordinary at first. We were tasked with retrieving an object from a secure underground laboratory, straightforward enough. However, as we ventured deeper into the labyrinth and structure, unsettling signs emerged. Bloodstains covered the walls and floors while shredded lab coats fluttered like grisly confetti. Feeling uneasy, we opened a sealed door to encounter Dr. Lawrence, who was sitting slumped against the wall, or what was left of him. His limbs were torn apart in a horrific manner, as if he'd been mauled by a monstrous creature. Jones gasped in horror. What could have done this? We need to call for backup, said Smithson shakily. No time, I retorted. We need to complete the mission now and get out of here. While we collected ourselves, I noticed Lawrence's satellite phone on the ground next to his body, its screen smashed rendering it useless. We proceeded cautiously through the eerie silence that blanketed us. As we neared our objective, our ears perked up at distant thuds and growls echoing closer by the second. Whatever tore Dr. Lawrence apart appeared to be still lurking around. Running out of options and with increasing tension, we made for the exit only to be greeted by a grotesque sight, a hulking, twisted abomination bearing an unsettling juxtaposition of human and animalistic features. The creature hunched over on all fours, its massive claws scraping the concrete with each stride. Its muscular torso was covered in a mottled, fleshy hide stretched tight over imposing bones. The creature spotted us and lunged forward with a blood-curdling screech. I fired several rounds into it, bullets tearing through its flesh, but it didn't seem to phase it in the slightest. Move! I yelled at the top of my lungs as we sprinted down the corridor with adrenaline coursing through our veins. The heavy breathing of the creature behind us filled our ears as we desperately tried to navigate the maze-like facility. "'Where's the damned exit?' cried Jones. "'We should split up. It can't chase all of us,' I yelled, 
deciding to take matters into my own hands. Smithson and I took one route while Jones went another way. The sounds of pursuit continued, snarls and heavy footfalls echoing throughout the labyrinth and hallways. We stumbled upon one of our teammates' remains, mangled beyond recognition. I think it got Jones, Smithson whispered. The realization hit us like a ton of bricks. We were alone, with no way to call for help, and trapped inside the facility with this bloodthirsty abomination. As we navigated through the corridors, I racked my brain trying to remember the layout of this place. At last, it came to me. There was an emergency escape tunnel on the east side of the facility. Smithson, follow me. I think I know where a possible escape route is. I whispered as we continued our evasive maneuvers, trying desperately to remain undetected. As we neared the tunnel entrance, relief washed over us briefly before being snuffed out by a horrifying realization. Jones' mutilated body lay just outside the entrance. The creature must have caught up to him in his attempt to escape. My throat tightened at the sight but I knew we couldn't linger or else we'd join him. Quickly, let's get out of here, I whispered urgently to Smithson. We edged around Joan's body and entered the dimly lit passage. It was narrow and dank with water dripping onto the cold concrete floor. We were completely vulnerable if the creature caught up with us here, but there was no turning back now. Suddenly we heard a blood-curdling roar echoing from behind us. It had found our escape route, or what was left of Jones, rather. Its snarls traveled through the winding tunnel walls as it drew nearer. Our nightmare surged toward us in unwavering pursuit. We sprinted down the tunnel with preternatural speed powering our every step. Bullets would do nothing against that monstrosity. It had made that quite clear earlier. We hoped beyond hope that there would be something, anything, beyond this narrow passageway that could save us. Finally, daylight broke through as we emerged from the tunnel's end into a dense forest far from the main facility. Our breaths came in ragged gasps as we struggled to keep our exhausted frames up and moving. Glancing back while our hearts pounded, we wondered if we had at last evaded the horrid creature. Luck, it seemed, was on our side— or perhaps the creature had given up. Either way, we didn't stick around long enough to find out. Using my knowledge of the landscape and the position of the sun, we navigated our way through the dense foliage for hours until we finally staggered upon a nearby road. Exhausted, starving, and grief-stricken, we managed to flag down a passing vehicle to take us back to civilization. We struggled to make sense of how such an ungodly creature could exist. But it did, and it cost Jones and Dr. Lawrence their lives. We reported everything that happened to our superiors once a debriefing was possible. It was met with disbelief, but after reviewing their text transmissions from within the facility, they had no choice but to dispatch teams back there for containment and neutralization. As for Smithson and me, we left that mission behind us with heavy hearts, knowing we had narrowly escaped with our lives. I would never forget Jones or Dr. Lawrence. They were both incredible human beings who deserved a far better fate. In our darkest moments in that labyrinth of horrors, they had clung desperately to hope creating an opportunity for survival. Their sacrifice ultimately saved two lives. But beyond even that, it helped ensure that whatever lurked inside that forgotten facility would be addressed before it could wreak further havoc on anyone else's world. That mission was behind us now, but its memory would follow us forever, a stark reminder of the hidden dangers lurking around every corner when you least expect them, those glimpses into the unnatural darkness that forces all brave individuals who confront it into uncomfortable truths about the fragility of life and what lies beyond the visible world. We could only hope that those who came after us in search of truth and safety would fare better than we had or those we left behind. 
There was no telling whether the next time would be their last. I wiped the sweat from my brow as I crouched behind a stack of wooden crates in an old warehouse located in the outskirts of Chicago. My name's Jeff Baxter, Navy SEAL, and I never thought I'd be involved in something like this. The atmosphere was tense, my heart pounding so hard I could feel it in my throat. My fellow SEAL, Darren Scotts, signaled for me to move forward. We were investigating reports of a string of gruesome murders that had shaken the city. With every passing moment, the warehouse seemed to grow taller and darker. The air was thick with a nauseating stench that clung to my nostrils. Our boots echoed across the grimy floor with each cautious step we took. Darren whispered to me, You ever wonder why sharks don't eat divorce lawyers? Why is that? I asked, keeping my eyes peeled for danger. Professional courtesy, he replied smirking. As we crept further into the warehouse, we came across a grisly scene. A mutilated body lay on the floor surrounded by a slick pool of blood. Upon closer inspection, it became clear that the unfortunate victim had been torn apart by something vicious and powerful. Damn, what do you think did him in? Darren questioned. I'm not certain, I murmured. But it's not any weapon or animal I've ever seen before. We pressed on through endless rows of abandoned machinery covered in cobwebs and rust. My muscles grew tight with anticipation as we moved closer to the back of the warehouse. Suddenly, an eerie silence fell upon us. Even the sound of our breathing seemed to vanish into the void. It was as if time stood still, until we heard it. A low growl echoed through the darkness. Darren and I exchanged panicked glances before diving for cover behind heavy machinery. The source of that demonic growl emerged from the shadows, a black, massive, and grotesque creature with razor-sharp claws at the end of its elongated arms. Its face was a malformed beast with soulless eyes that struck fear into the depths of my being. I couldn't believe such a thing existed. This monster belonged in legends, not walking among men. But here it was, and it was real. Another deep growl emanated from the creature as it sniffed the air, searching for us with its predatory instincts. Darren pulled out his prize Glock 17 while I gripped my MP5 tightly, ready for what was to come. Remember, whispered Darren, if we meet a bear in the woods, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. As if amused by Darren's gallows humor, the beast let out a bellowing roar and charged straight towards us. Our guns blazed in desperate retaliation as we tried to bring down this living nightmare. But no matter how many bullets pierced its hide, it did not relent. Cornered and outmatched by this seemingly unstoppable force, we played a deadly game of cat and mouse. We darted from one cover to another in an attempt to stay ahead of its relentless pursuit. We continued running, our exhausted bodies reaching their limits. We needed a plan, and we needed one fast. However, fear clouded our ability to think logically. Darren, let's call the police, I yelled, as we ducked behind an old truck for a temporary reprieve. No signal in here, Darren snapped. And even if there was, they wouldn't believe us. The creature had wiped out its initial target a group of warehouse workers who had unfortunately stayed late that fateful day. There was no one else nearby who could help us. Our only hope was to escape the beast. As we weighed our options, I spotted several canisters of industrial strength cleaning chemicals across the room. It was a long shot, but the thought of using them against the creature crossed my mind. Darren, see that? The chemicals might slow it down or distract it long enough for us to get away. 
I said. It's worth a try. Darren agreed, desperation evident in his voice. We made our way to the chemicals, doing our best to remain silent and avoid drawing attention to our location. Reaching them without incident, we grabbed several canisters and looked for an opportunity to spring our improvised trap. Our chance came when the creature paused to sniff the air again, giving us just enough time to hurl the canisters at it. The chemicals exploded upon impact, engulfing the beast in a torrent of hazardous fumes and corrosive liquids. Its howls filled the air as it writhed in apparent pain and agitation. Though not defeated by any means, the creature seemed temporarily disoriented or distracted by its own suffering, precisely what we needed for our escape. Without wasting another moment, we dashed towards the nearest exit. The heavy metal door creaked open just enough for us to fit through as we frantically stumbled out into the cold night air. There, we continued running towards the warehouse's perimeter fence. Once we finally created significant distance between ourselves and the hellish nightmare that lurked within, we stopped to catch our breath. Relief washed over us as we realized we had escaped with our lives, for now. God, what was that thing? Darren gasped. We shared a look of disbelief and shock, unable to fathom what we had just survived. I don't know, I replied, shaking my head. But if it can survive that chemical onslaught, who knows what else it could withstand? We knew that we wouldn't be safe for long. By sunrise, the creature would likely regain its strength and resume its pursuit. We needed help, and if the police didn't believe us, perhaps there was someone else who would. In the morning, I suggested, we need to find someone, anyone, who knows about this kind of stuff. An expert or something. Darren nodded in agreement, knowing it was our only option. Neither of us mentioned the fate of those unfortunate warehouse workers whose lives were brutally snuffed out by an unimaginable force. We could only hope to avenge their deaths by finding a way to stop the creature from harming others. As dawn approached, we began our search for someone who could help us confront and ultimately destroy the monster that hounded us. That would not be an easy task, nor one without grave risk, but if doing so meant saving lives, including our own, then it was a task worth undertaking. What lay ahead for us remained uncertain. The horrors of our encounter proving too gruesome and terrifying to fully comprehend just yet, as day broke over the city skyline, one thing was brutally clear. This was only the beginning of our fight against an unknown adversary stronger than anything we'd ever known. And we couldn't let it win. Failure simply wasn't an option. I just finished my coffee. Savoring the last of it as my teammate, Chester Greer, cracked another joke to ease the tension surrounding us. We were in a small town in Virginia, miles away from any major cities. The area was known for its beautiful forests and serene landscapes a picturesque slice of rural America. Our assignment was unique and required our full attention. We were to investigate a series of unexplained deaths that had shaken the community to its core. Being a Navy SEAL, I knew my way around dangerous situations, but this felt different somehow, like nothing we had ever encountered before. I introduced myself to the local sheriff, Stuart Talbot, who looked exhausted and shaken by the recent events. The bodies discovered at the crime scenes exhibited horrifying signs of violence. Animals gnawed at human organs and scattered bones everywhere. The public and media demanded immediate answers. As we continued our investigation, Chester noticed something peculiar near one of the locations, unusual footprints unlike any animal track we'd ever seen. This piqued our curiosity as we decided to search the surrounding woods deeper. 
The dense forest made it difficult for us to navigate through the underbrush, with twisted vines and branches clogging our path. Patience wore thin as fear began to choke us. During one particularly exhausting day chasing leads, Chester went missing when we briefly split up to cover more ground. Panicked shouts flooded the airwaves through our radios as we searched for him relentlessly. After hours of searching, a blood-curdling scream pierced the darkness. When we followed it, we found a gruesome scene. Chester's mangled body lay against a tree trunk, barely recognizable with deep claw marks and bite wounds covering his body. In that moment of shock and despair, something caught my eye a shape darting away from us deep into the woods. The creature was hulking. Layers of muscle adorned its twisted body as thick, matted black fur covered the bizarre figure. At this point, I knew we weren't dealing with anything normal, and my heart dropped. Numb with fear but fueled by adrenaline, we charged after the beast. It scrambled through the forest with ease, barely making a sound despite its massive size. Suddenly it halted in front of us and turned to face our team. I had never seen anything so horrifying. Razor-sharp teeth lined a mouth that dripped with venom, while its long claws and powerful legs appeared designed for tearing apart prey with no mercy. Emitting a primal roar, the creature charged at us like a tank hurling through the woods. Knowing that our lives were on the line, I opened fire on the monstrosity, bullets ripping through the air as my colleagues joined in. We were Navy SEALs, trained for battle under any circumstance. But this beast stood strong under our assault, occasionally swiping back at us and leaving deep gashes in its wake. Our team regrouped and devised a plan to escape the creature's relentless pursuit. We knew we had to make it back to our base to call for help, as our radios were proving useless in the dense forest. The heavy foliage seemed to hinder the connection, making it impossible to establish contact with the outside world. We split into smaller groups, in the hope that at least some of us would make it back safely and secure assistance. Each group went in a different direction, with the designated meeting point set beforehand. As we scattered, I couldn't help but fear for my teammates' lives knowing that not all of us might survive this ordeal. As my group hurried through the woods, stumbling over roots and branches, we noticed drops of blood along our path. The creature had been injured during our previous confrontation, giving us a gruesome trail to follow. We treaded cautiously, acutely aware that we were not only tracking it but potentially drawing its attention again. Night began to fall, and danger seemed to close in around us. We continued following the blood trail under the dim moonlight. Then I noticed something strange the blood spots began deviating from a straight path and formed a peculiar pattern. Moments later, we heard guttural growls from behind us. The creature had circled back and was yet again stalking us with predatory intent. Run! I shouted at my teammates as we sprinted through the darkness, each of us desperate to reach safety. The creature pursued relentlessly, maintaining a terrifying pace despite its injury. Its growls echoed through the forest as it closed in on us. One by one, my teammates were picked off by the vicious beast, their screams haunting me as I watched them fall victim to its ferocity. Finally alone and close to despair, I reached a clearing where I could glimpse our base camp through the trees. My heart pounded as I contemplated my chances of making it there alive. I took a deep breath and sprinted towards the camp, unwilling to face death without putting up a fight. The creature roared behind me, a primal sound that sent shivers down my spine, reaffirming just how close it was. I could feel its presence, its rancid breath, almost palpable on the back of my neck. But then I saw something that brought me hope. Spotlights from the camp were headed my way. They must have heard the commotion and were coming to investigate. Determined to survive, 
I leaped forward with every remaining ounce of strength and collided headlong into our rescuers. They quickly pulled me into one of their vehicles, training their weapons on the creature as it hesitated at the edge of the clearing. As our vehicle careened away from the scene, I glanced back to witness the horrifying beast disappear once again into the shadows from which it came. The ride back to camp was eerily quiet, as everyone present was shaken by the night's gruesome events. Safe behind fortified walls, I recounted what had transpired to our commanding officer, who listened intently and somberly promised that no expense would be spared in dispatching this abomination. Our surviving team members were left scarred by our experience in the forest. Each of us mourned for those we lost Chester and other fallen comrades whose lives had been brutally taken by an unspeakable evil. Though our bodies might heal over time, we knew deep down that the horror we witnessed in those woods would stay with us forever. I was sipping my black coffee in the mess hall, recalling that time someone I knew made a joke about how it tasted worse than motor oil. My name is Callum Spicer, a Navy SEAL on a top-secret mission, and I never thought I'd find myself here at the infamous Alcatraz Island. My team and I were sent to investigate unusual activity reported in the underground tunnels beneath the notorious prison. Hey, Tom, mind passing that hot sauce? Samantha Winters, our explosives expert, asked, as if nothing unusual was happening. As we geared up for our night operation, I remember feeling skeptical about the whole situation. But work was work. I tightened the straps on my gear and checked my firearm. It couldn't hurt to be prepared for anything. Our journey took us through creepy passageways filled with shadows that seemed to move by themselves. We studied our surroundings with professional precision, marking each tunnel we explored as we went deeper into the belly of Alcatraz. You know why ghosts are bad liars? Jack Hayes asked as he walked beside me, scanning the darkness with his flashlight. Why? I replied in a whisper. Because you can see right through them. He chuckled softly and continued walking forward. In one dimly lit room, we stumbled upon a gruesome sight, a body mangled beyond recognition. That's when we knew this mission was no laughing matter. We radioed for backup but found ourselves unable to make contact. Something was interfering with our signals. We had no choice but to move forward determined to uncover whatever malevolence awaited us. We continued cautiously as unexplained noises echoed around us. Footsteps followed us where none could have been. Raspy breaths grew louder in our ears. Metal scraped against metal like fingernails on a chalkboard. On later missions that succeeded this one, assuming there were any, I might recall this life-changing incident through the lens of newfound understanding. But at that moment, when the monster revealed itself, a sharpened grin, something like a cross between a bear and a mantis, except far more terrible, it was believably and logically real. Its claws glinted in the dark, like serrated steel knives meant to maim and mutilate. Its eyes were orbs of green, pulsating with hunger as it gazed upon its prey. Without warning, the creature lunged at Jack easily tearing him apart with claws that seemed to elongate with every swipe. The team retaliated. Gunfire echoed throughout the tunnels, but none of our bullets seemed to slow it down. Horrified, I shot my weapon continuously until all I heard were dull clicks. It was no use. The creature was right on top of me, its breath foul-smelling and hot against my face. Stop! Samantha yelled as she tossed a flash spang grenade at the last second, momentarily blinding the beast. With the creature momentarily stunned, Samantha and I took the opportunity to run. We dashed through the dimly lit corridors, 
not wanting to look back and see if the monstrosity was following us. Our earlier inability to call for help was still a concern, as there seemed to be no way for us to reach our team or summon reinforcements. As we ran through the labyrinth-like complex, we tried opening various doors with no success. They were locked or blocked from the other side. It was beginning to feel hopeless until one door finally gave way, revealing a small room that looked like it had been used as an office. Inside, we found a walkie-talkie that crackled to life as we picked it up. The interference seemed weaker here, enough for us to communicate with our command center. We need backup. There's a creature down here, out of control and incredibly dangerous. Samantha screamed into the walkie-talkie, her voice a mixture of fear and urgency. No response came for a moment before it crackled again. Hold your position. Backup is on its way. We locked the door and used whatever we could find, desks, chairs, file cabinets, to barricade ourselves in. The creature didn't waste time. Soon enough, we could hear it just outside the door scratching and clawing as it tried to break through. Samantha and I were cornered like prey in a cage. We both gripped our weapons tightly though they had proven ineffective before. There was nothing more we could do but hope that help would arrive in time. Minutes felt like hours as the creature attempted over and over again to break down the door. Finally, through heavy static over the walkie-talkie, we heard someone say that they had arrived at our location. The relief washed over me like a waterfall as I registered salvation might be near. However, like a predator scenting blood in the water, the creature responded to the noise as well. It let out a shriek of rage and violence, forcing the metal door to bend inward. Panicked, we desperately pushed against the barrier in an attempt to keep it at bay. The door exploded open, showering us in fragments as backup stormed into the room, just in time. The creature let out another roar before charging toward one of our new teammates. They quickly dispersed to avoid its claws and used various weapons, flamethrowers, blades, and high-powered rifles to assault the beast. As Samantha and I stood back, trying to comprehend what was happening, we watched helplessly as our rescuers fought the creature without any apparent luck. It seemed all but invincible. Gas! Use gas! Samantha shouted suddenly. She had noticed several canisters of a powerful sedative earlier in the room that were used to subdue aggressive specimens. Members of our team leaped into action, grabbing canisters and improvising makeshift launchers for them using their equipment. In no time, gas flooded the area, enveloping the beast within it. The creature spasmed with each breath it took, its fury compounded with agitation as its limbs began to slow down from the sedative's effects. As it stumbled about, caught in an inescapable web of slumberous poison, one last push from a high-powered rifle sent it crashing down. Exhausted but alive, we surveyed our surroundings. We knew nothing of this nightmare's purpose or why it was here, our curiosity overshadowed by horror after witnessing its carnage firsthand. In that moment we swore never to forget our losses. Jack had been brave till the end and died fulfilling his duty. In the days following our encounter with the creature, reports were filed, cleanup crews sent in to rid the facility of any trace of what transpired there. Our wounds began to heal, both physically and mentally. We knew there would be other missions, perhaps darker than this one, but we had survived. As a team, we emerged stronger and more resolute in the face of whatever terrors the next mission would hold. And with each battle won, and each fallen comrade honored, we continued to fight and protect the world from nightmares hidden in the depths of darkness. I just finished my cup of lukewarm coffee, 
the last of what our rations allowed, when we got the call. Elijah Dane, this is a priority one situation at Delna Woods Park. The voice crackled through my radio. I quickly gathered my gear and headed to the rendezvous point. My team assembled as fast as lightning, Mykala, Bulldog, Ross, our demolitions expert, DeAndre, Blitz, Palmer, our sharpshooter, and Shante, Viper, Farnsworth, our medic. We were hastily briefed on a secret mission involving missing civilians and possible mutilated bodies in the park. As we entered Delmer Woods Park, I couldn't help but think about how surreal it was to find myself on a mission so close to home. The park was a beautiful mix of dense forests, winding trails, and the breathtaking Fox River. A place ideal for hiking and picnicking had transformed into our battleground. During our search, we stumbled upon a playground eerily quiet and abandoned. Gazing across the sea of thick trees nearby, Blitz joked nervously. Whoever designed this park must have hated kids. Look at all these creepy hiding spots for monsters. Little did he know how terrifyingly accurate his joke would become. Advancing deeper into the park, we discovered an old bunker previously used during World War II. It appeared abandoned but still remarkably intact. With caution, we descended beneath the earth into its cold concrete depths. We found evidence that someone or something had been living there, scraps of human clothing and half-eaten pieces of unrecognizable meat littered the floor. My stomach churned as Viper inspected a particularly gruesome mess mere feet from where we stood. Just then, Bulldog spotted large claw marks etched into a nearby wall. Her eyes filled with fear and concern as she noted how fresh the marks were. The atmosphere in the damp, dark bunker had become heavy and suffocating. We could all sense a dangerous presence lurking nearby. As we continued down the dimly lit tunnel, we suddenly heard it. A guttural growl echoed through the confined space, sending shivers down my spine. Clutching my weapon tightly, I signaled for my team to brace themselves. And then it appeared an enormous, monstrous creature barreling straight towards us. Its appearance defied understanding, a hulking mass of fur and mangled flesh, with enormous tusks and claws capable of shredding human bones. Its eyes were wild, bloodshot, and filled with an unspeakable rage that chilled me to my core. The creature lunged at Blitz, its gaping maw filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. As he barely managed to avoid its onslaught, Viper took aim and fired her sidearm into its flank. The onslaught hadn't even slowed as Bulldog had tossed a small explosive device beneath the abomination causing it to stumble momentarily. Pure survival instincts kicked in, and we engaged this nightmare in relentless combat. With no time to think, we made a collective decision to run for our lives. We scrambled back through the dark tunnel, the monstrous creature's growls and ferocious roars just inches behind us. We didn't think about calling for help. Our focus was solely on getting as far away from this horrifying beast as possible. Blitz tripped and fell on a piece of debris, his body tumbling down onto the cold concrete. I reached out to help him up, but it was too late. The creature closed in on him grasping his leg with its enormous claw. Blitz screamed in pain as his leg was crushed in an instant. Viper called out to him but continued running without turning back. We managed to reach the surface and scrambled up from the bunker entrance, Viper slamming the heavy steel door shut. We could hear the monster pounding against it from below as we caught our breaths. What are we supposed to do now? Bulldog asked nervously, her voice trembling. We need help, I replied, gripping my weapon tight. We have to get back to base and gather reinforcements. As we made our way back through the park, we kept an eye on our surroundings, remaining vigilant for any sign of movement or danger. 
Our thoughts were consumed by worry for blitz and questions about what exactly that monster was. Upon arriving at base, we immediately reported what had transpired in the bunker and demanded support. Our superiors were initially skeptical of our account but took quick action as they saw the terror in our eyes. A heavily armed team accompanied us back to the bunker, ready to face whatever lurked beneath its depths. The steel door now twisted and mangled from the beast's efforts. It appeared it had retreated for now. We reluctantly led them through each dark corridor with equal amounts of caution and dread building up within each step taken. The attack commenced as soon as we reached the spot where Blitz had fallen. The creature erupted from the shadows, slamming into one of the armed team members and tearing through them with ease. Flames from the squad's flamethrowers danced across its hide, enraging the beast as it continued its relentless assault. The battle raged on, filling the confined space with blood, gore, and the pained cries of our comrades. The creature's rage seemed endless and unmatched by anything we had ever come across before. After an intense struggle that felt like ours, Bulldog saw her chance. She hurled a grenade directly into the mouth of the creature as it attempted to lunge at her. The force of the explosion shook the bunker's foundation, blowing a massive hole through the creature's skull and finally silencing its roars and growls. We stood in the now quiet tunnel, surveying the grisly aftermath of our ordeal. We lost several more team members in addition to Blitz, gone forever in this gruesome display of sacrifice and overturn. When we debriefed our haunting experience, we were ordered to keep our findings confidential, permanently sealing all documents related to that night. Though it was hard to accept what we'd encountered and those we'd lost, we eventually continued on with our lives. The park was closed indefinitely for maintenance issues. Bulldozers came in to seal that bunker forevermore. As solid concrete took place over the entrance that had led us into hell and back, I couldn't help but remember each life claimed by that nightmare within those cold concrete walls. Blitz, crawler, duffel brave souls who stood tall until their end. It didn't matter whether people knew about them or not. They would always be heroes in my eyes. And although I knew sealing off that place would retract a tinge of justice for them all, deep down in my thoughts I couldn't help but question if there might be other horrors waiting just around the bend, that band-aids to seal off atrocities might not be enough. But only time would tell. I took a deep breath as I entered the dilapidated building, trying to ignore the pungent smell of decay. My name is Emmett Fowler, and I am a Navy SEAL currently on a secret mission in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of Barstow, California. The atmosphere inside was dark and gloomy, with only faint light seeping through the dusty windows. Hey Emmett, did you know that spiders can eat frogs? Crazy, right? Called out my teammate Ronson McKay, trying to inject some humor into our tense situation. I'm not sure that's going to help us much right now. I replied, keeping my focus on the task at hand. Every footstep echoed through the empty halls as we advanced cautiously. We were tracking a serial killer who had been responsible for numerous atrocious murders throughout Southern California. Unfortunately, none of us knew what he looked like. His victims had never seen his face and lived to tell about it. We reached a room filled with rusted machinery and strange contraptions. Crouching down to examine one of them, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I whispered to my team, Eyes open, guys. We might be walking straight into a trap. Just then, we heard an ear-piercing screech emanating from the shadows. We turned around and saw a grotesque figure approaching us slowly. It was far from human, standing close to seven feet tall with scaly skin covered in slime. 
As we retreated further into the warehouse's depths in search of cover, Ronson muttered under his breath. I'd rather be on frog catching duty. The creature lunged violently at one of our squad members but narrowly missed them. Let's split up, I ordered, hoping that would increase our chances of taking this monstrous antagonist down. We ventured alone into different parts of the warehouse. My breath grew more labored as I gripped my gun tightly, my finger poised on the trigger. Even with years of military experience, I had never encountered anything like this. It seemed to anticipate our every move, stalking us from the shadows and striking at opportune moments. In one horrific instance, I discovered the mutilated bodies of two teammates who had fallen prey to this beast. Their injuries were beyond description. That only heightened my determination to stop this creature for good, even if it were the last thing I accomplished in my life. As I made my way through a long and narrow corridor, a sudden movement caught my attention. A slimy trail on the floor marked the creature's passage. I followed it hesitantly through a maze of decrepit machinery, fully aware that this might be what it wanted me to do. My heart pounded relentlessly as I rounded a corner, prepared to face whatever was waiting for me. There it stood, amidst the darkness and decay, the cold-blooded murderer responsible for countless deaths in our area. It towered over me, its breathing heavy and raspy. Its teeth were like jagged daggers, ready to rip into flesh. It appeared to have some primal intelligence— as if it knew exactly what it was doing and truly enjoyed the chaos it wrought. I knew I couldn't fight it alone. I had to call for backup. Grabbing my radio, I attempted to make contact with the remaining team members. Anyone out there? I need help. I whispered urgently into the radio, trying not to alert the creature of my whereabouts. To my relief, a crackle of static came through before a shaky voice responded. Captain? I'm here. What's your location? It was Vasquez, one of our newest recruits. Her voice sounded scared but determined. I'm in the northwest sector, I replied quickly. Bring anyone else you have with you. We need to take this thing down together. We're on our way she said before cutting the transmission. The creature moved towards me, its nostrils flaring as it sniffed in my direction. My heart raced violently as I tried my best to remain silent and hidden. Then, suddenly, a sharp noise echoed throughout the warehouse as Vasquez and the others burst in from a side entrance. The distraction proved to be enough for me to find cover behind a large crate. The beast snarled and turned its attention towards the intruders. They opened fire, but their bullets seemed to have little effect on the monster as it charged at them with relentless fury. As it approached them, I had an idea, a desperate plan which we had no choice but to try. Vasquez! I called out over the radio. Find something flammable! We need to trap this thing in fire! Vasquez acknowledged the order and raced off with two other squad members, searching for anything that could help us in our fight. The creature continued its rampage, brutally striking anyone within its reach. A scream echoed through the warehouse, followed by the sound of rending flesh. Another teammate was lost, their name forever etched into my memory, Ramirez. I fought back the bile threatening to rise in my throat at the grisly sight and focused on the task at hand. There was no time for grief, not yet. Finally, Vasquez and her team returned with an assortment of flammable materials. They quickly set up a trap, creating a circle of fire around the beast. The creature shrieked and hissed as it attempted to break free, but the flames intensified, trapping it further. We huddled together as we watched our monstrous tormentor consumed by the inferno. Its screeches filled our ears until there was only silence. The creature lay motionless on the charred ground, 
defeated at last. We stared at each other in exhausted disbelief for a moment before I contacted command to report our victory and losses. As we waited for reinforcements to arrive, we mourned our fallen comrades, Ramirez and the others who paid the ultimate price in our battle against this abhorrent predator. In defeat, it was no longer a terrifying monster. It seemed smaller somehow a grotesque mass of scorched flesh and terror that we had managed to overcome. As I stood there with my surviving teammates, I knew that we would carry the memories of this night with us forever, the horrors we had faced and our loved ones lost. But we also knew that together, no matter what hellish adversary awaited us in future missions, we would always find a way to conquer the darkness and survive as one united force. My stomach churned as I dug into the cold spaghetti at the staff cafeteria. Really, Evans? We couldn't get something fresh? I sarcastically asked my fellow Navy SEAL, Matthias Evans. Sorry, Conrad, Matthias replied with a shrug. You know how it's like here in Thule Air Base, Greenland. We take whatever we can get. A throat-clearing sound interrupted us. Lieutenant Comrade Sinclair, orders from the top, our commanding officer said. We've got intel saying there's some suspicious activity at an old research facility nearby. It's worth checking out. Before long, our team had assembled and we set off towards the derelict facility. Everything seemed mundane and ordinary until we reached the compound. To say it looked eerie would be an understatement. The place had been abandoned for years, with overgrown vegetation claiming its territory within the compound. As we cautiously made our way inside, a rotting stench assaulted our senses. Within minutes of investigating the research units, we reached a horrifying scene. A mangled corpse lay sprawled on the floor with deep claw-like marks adorning its lifeless body. Dear God! Matthias whispered as he tried to hold his breakfast down. The rest of us exchanged uneasy glances and continued searching for any sign of what could have inflicted such violence. As we cautiously moved deeper into the facility, our guard had never been higher. Suddenly, an ear-splitting shriek echoed through the hallways causing me to involuntarily jerk my gun up as I scanned around for any source of danger. Then I saw it. Nothing could have prepared me for the creature that stood before us. Eight foot tall with sickening gray skin held together by crude stitches, tight over its muscle-bound frame. It had razor-sharp claws sprouting from long arms that nearly touched the ground and eyes devoid of humanity. A terrible grin filled with jagged teeth that could tear a man apart in a heartbeat. It barreled towards us with impressive speed, and I yelled for the team to open fire. Our bullets seemed to barely slow it down. Conrad, we've got to retreat! Matthias cried as he fired off another round at the abomination. No! Hold your ground! I ordered, fighting back the fear clawing at my insides. Can't we just call for help? One of my teammates shouted over the noise of our desperate barrage of gunfire. No damn time! I screamed back. If we hesitated any longer, we would all be doomed. In a panic, I made the only move that made sense. I yelled for the team to retreat. We frantically scrambled to run away from the creature, with Matthias leading the way. The grisly scene had taken its toll on him, and he sprinted with desperation. We kept getting split up as we navigated the labyrinth of corridors while trying to escape. The creature showed no mercy. It relentlessly pursued us despite our efforts to put as much distance between us as possible. Every time I thought about calling for help, I realized it was futile. The commotion caused by our gunfire 
and the monstrous sounds of our pursuer would be enough to alert anyone in range that we were in grave danger. And there simply wasn't enough time to waste. The creature was always right behind us. The brutal chase went on for what felt like hours but could only have been a matter of minutes. As we reached a junction in one of the corridors, I suddenly heard a gut-wrenching scream. Amy had been caught. The sound pierced through me like a knife, but we couldn't stop to help her. We continued running, carrying the weight of her loss with each panic step. With every turn and twist in our desperate escape attempt, hope dwindled. It started to feel inevitable that we would meet the same gruesome fate as Amy. But luck seemed to be on our side when we stumbled upon an exit door by chance and made our way outside. Just as I thought we had outrun the horrifying monstrosity, Matthias got grabbed by one of its long arms and dragged back toward the research units. He screamed for help, tears streaming down his face as he clawed at anything within reach for purchase. At that moment, I did something entirely out of character. Instead of running away or ordering my remaining teammates to save themselves, I charged back inside in an attempt to rescue Matthias. The adrenaline coursed through my veins, and survival instincts kicked in. What the hell are you doing? We need to get out of here, one of the surviving teammates shrieked, but I didn't care. I found Matthias being pinned to the ground by the creature as it prepared to deliver a fatal blow. In sheer desperation, I hurled a fire extinguisher at the abomination's head with all my might. To my amazement, that was enough to distract the monster for a split second, providing an opening for Matthias and me to escape back outside. The surviving members of our team scrambled into nearby vehicles and started their engines, speeding away from the facility as fast as possible. As I sped down the road, Every muscle in my body trembled from shock and fear. We had escaped with our lives, but we had lost Amy and left behind a scene rife with unanswered questions. The nightmare haunted us for days after the event. Every time we closed our eyes or heard a sound that resembled that dreadful screech from inside the facility, our hearts jumped into our throats. We could not forget the gruesome sight of Amy's lifeless body or Matthias' fear-stricken face as he was dragged away by that monstrous creature. Despite the terrible events we experienced, we found solace in each other's company as we mourned our fallen colleague and tried to piece together what happened at that nightmarish facility. The carnage we left behind on that harrowing day became a symbol of both loss and survival a constant reminder of a burden we would carry for the rest of our lives. I was sitting in my favorite diner, sipping coffee when my best buddy and fellow Navy SEAL, Wyatt Grimes, walked in with a huge grin. You won't believe the secret mission they've assigned us to, Jack! he exclaimed. What's the intel on this one? Wyatt leaned in closer and whispered. We're investigating a series of gruesome murders taking place near Deer Trail, Colorado. A small isolated town known for its vast wilderness. Interesting, I replied. Let's get moving then. Upon arrival at Deer Trail, we introduced ourselves to the local sheriff Dolores Banks. Been quite a mess here lately, she sighed. We hope you fellas can help us. You could say that again, Wyatt laughed. Jack almost stepped on a banana peel back at the diner. Everyone chuckled, a much-needed moment of levity, as we were about to dive into something dark and sinister. Wyatt and I continued to collect information on the crime scenes. So far... Formulated bodies had been found in different parts of the dense forest surrounding the town. All victims showed signs of being attacked by an animal but were unrecognizable due to their condition. As we ventured deeper into the forest, we met Edgar and Bella Benson, 
who lived secluded from other residents. Edgar revealed that they'd occasionally seen a creature lurking in the woods, but couldn't offer any specifics about its appearance. I'll tell you what I know. Its moving pattern seems unnatural, Bella added grimly. Unwilling to waste time, Wyatt and I set up cameras throughout the forest. Days turned into weeks as we monitored them closely but found nothing suspicious, until one fateful evening. The footage showed a blurry figure in the distance, clearly not like any natural animal, but impossible to describe its form accurately. Unnerved yet determined, we decided to track down this creature ourselves. We left a note at the diner to inform Sheriff Banks and followed the trails we'd observed in the video. Man, this forest gives me the creeps, Wyatt muttered as we trudged on. Do you think it's always this quiet or are we in one of those slasher movies with the unpredictable violin music? I shot out a snort at this nervous quip. It was classic Wyatt humor for relieving tension. We suddenly heard footsteps behind us, and Wyatt whispered, That's definitely not violin music. The sound grew louder, and just as we turned around, a massive beast leaped from behind a tree. This creature towered over us with glistening black skin covered in peculiar scales. Its large talons dripped with fresh blood, and piercing red eyes seemed to hypnotize our gaze. As it snarled menacingly, razor-sharp teeth protruded from its gnarled muzzle. Don't move, I whispered to Wyatt, uneasy about the possibility of enraging the creature further if we made any false moves. It paced back and forth, studying us as if deciding how to proceed. Our training had prepared us for adversity, but nothing could have prepared us for this visceral confrontation with a grotesque monster out of nightmares. The creature let out a guttural growl as it slowly began to approach us, each step burdened with the weight of an unknown intent. Wyatt snapped out of his hypnotic state and quickly pulled out his phone to dial for help. However, it was futile. There was no signal in this part of the forest. I could see the beads of sweat gathering on Wyatt's forehead as he fumbled with the device, eventually giving up in frustration. Our eyes momentarily locked before we instinctively broke into a terrified sprint, scrambling through the underbrush in a desperate attempt to evade the monster that hunted us. The creature's chase was relentless, only growing bolder as its massive limbs thrashed and clawed through the woods in its pursuit. Panicked cries echo through our ragged breaths as Wyatt and I push our bodies to the limit, adrenaline surging through every fiber of our being. A yelp rang through the air as Wyatt suddenly tripped over a gnarled tree root, sending him crashing to the ground. The sound seemed to halt the creature's pursuit just for a moment, long enough for me to grab my friend's arm and drag him back onto his feet. Painfully aware of our dwindling options, we dove into a narrow crevice hidden amongst moss-covered boulders. The space was cramped and almost suffocating, but it offered a sliver of shelter from that monstrous presence bearing down on us. Crouched in terror within our haven, we held our breaths as the creature prowled closer. A low, rumbling growl reverberated through the rocks, shaking us to our core. We braced ourselves for the inevitable as its terrible visage briefly emerged somewhere overhead, the moonlight illuminating those dreadful red eyes like beacons amongst the shadows. But then, inexplicably, it retreated, its growls fading into silence once more. Minutes crawled by, feeling like an eternity as Wyatt and I maintained our silence within the crevice, waiting for some sign that the creature was finally gone until at last we dared to whisper. Do you think it's over? There was no way to be sure, but we could not remain there any longer. Slowly and carefully, we crawled out of our hiding place, scanning the area in search of that soul-chilling monster that had stalked us so viciously. To our relief, there was no trace to be found. As we stumbled back toward the diner, 
our hearts still pounding in our chests. We couldn't help but mourn the lives lost to this insidious beast in days past, mere pawns in a game of primal terror. Would we be forever haunted by those chilling memories? Only time would tell. But for now, despite the fear that stole our breath, we were alive. And one thing seemed certain. Something needed to be done about that horrifying creature lurking in the shadows. Even if Wyatt and I wouldn't be the ones to bring about its end, perhaps our tale would serve as a warning for others who dared to traverse those eerie woods. I'd just finished my morning workout and was looking forward to a hot cup of joe when my phone rang. It was my commander, urgently instructing me to report to the base at once. My name is Trenton McKnight, and I'm a Navy SEAL stationed near a small, lesser-known, rural town called Huxley in Iowa. Unknown to most people, it's an important strategic location due to its proximity to certain governmental installations. At the base, my teammates, Foley and Cross, were waiting with the same urgency in their eyes. There's been a gruesome murder nearby, said Cross as he handed me some crime scene photos. A chill went down my spine as I saw a body, torn apart with limbs scattered across the forest floor. What happened here? I asked, trying to stay objective despite the horrifying sight. Beats me. Foley said, showing that even experienced military men like us couldn't easily digest this sight. He motioned us toward our jeep. Let's investigate ASAP. As we drove towards the scene, we recalled an old joke. What's worse than finding a worm in your apple? Finding half a worm. That got us chuckling despite the nerves. Once there... Our investigation found tracks leading deeper into the woods. They weren't human. They resembled paw prints but larger and sharper than any animal we'd seen before. We stealthily followed these tracks for half an hour until we came across a small waterfall next to which stood an abandoned shack. We signaled each other with hand gestures. Foley circled over one side of the shack while Cross took his position on the other. The tension in the air was palpable. Fearful silence embraced us as we approached. Suddenly, with brute force and sheer terror stroking our spines, our unspoken thoughts tumbled into chaos as we saw it. Large, black, and beast-like with eyes like lit embers. It stood on all fours, towering over us, its fur matted and reeking of blood. Its teeth glistened with a lethal sharpness. Foley whispered into the mic. Stay on your toes, team. We've found it. Although we had never known of the creature before, we could hear the petrifying conviction in his voice that whatever it was could be responsible for the murder. Struggling to keep my voice steady, I said, We need backup and firepower. I quickly took out my phone and dialed for backup, emphasizing the urgency of our situation. While I spoke to headquarters, Foley and Cross took positions around the shack, ensuring the creature was cornered. Backup arrived swiftly, along with animal control and other specialized equipment. The creature snarled menacingly, but remained trapped. It seemed to comprehend the danger it was in. We stood ready to neutralize the creature when it made an unexpected move. In a matter of seconds, it lunged forward and tackled one of our men, sinking its teeth into his shoulder as he screamed in agony. Shots rang out from all around as we tried to subdue the beast. Finally, with a primal roar, the creature went limp while still clutching at our injured companion. With more personnel now on site to deal with the creature's carcass, we turned our attention to those injured in the scuffle. One man had already succumbed to their injuries and another was barely clinging to life. As they lifted him onto a stretcher and carried him towards an ambulance, 
My mind raced wondering whether his condition was due only to physical trauma or if there were unknown agents at play. I joined some investigators as they combed through the abandoned shack. Inside, we found torn clothes and gruesome remains of what we assumed were earlier victims of this monstrous predator. As night began to fall, our team collected samples and bagged evidence at the scene so that nothing was left unexamined. The heart-wrenching events of this day would not be in vain. We would do everything in our power to understand how this nightmare could have taken place. A few days later, we received news that the injured man would survive but would bear the scars of his encounter forever, not just physically but mentally as well. It left us all reflecting on how quickly ordinary lives had been turned upside down by an inexplicable horror lurking in these very woods. Reports came back from the lab, indicating that the creature was a previously unknown species with distinct features that allowed it to survive and thrive in this environment. Its predatory nature, however, made its discovery a nightmare that caught us all unprepared. The fact that none of us had ever heard of or seen something like this before was a sobering reminder that our world still held terrifying secrets waiting to be uncovered. No one could say for certain if there were more of these creatures out there. Our division would continue working with animal control, monitoring the area vigilantly for any potential threats. We owed it to the memory of those lost in this ordeal to be diligent. Life was forever altered. We could no longer take our previously uneventful days for granted. Every time we journeyed into those woods in the future, we remembered our fallen comrades and the unknown terrors only steps away from our own reality. We learned a valuable lesson on the importance of being prepared for what might lurk around us, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. It also showed us that calling for help when needed isn't just about saving ourselves but protecting others from similar fates. The memories of this gruesome incident would never fade. Each time we walked through those woods, tread cautiously near an abandoned shack or remembered our fallen brother, we were reminded of a world unseen yet dangerously close. And while each day continued on, we knew that out there lurking in the shadows was an ever-present reminder of darkness waiting to consume.